Good morning, everyone. My name is Council Gary Crawford. I'm the chair of the Budget Committee. A clerk has confirmed that we have quorum. I'd like to call meeting 44 of the Budget Committee to order and welcome everyone. Today's meeting is being held with the members of the Budget Committee participating by video conference and city staff are also connected to the meeting by video conference. The public continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. These measures are necessary, uh, of course, uh, for public health guidelines and to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And ask for everyone's patience um, if we do have any technical issues today. Um, the city clerk has provided all agenda materials by the clerk's meeting portal. Uh, clerk's IT staff will be available to participants to help with your devices if you're having any issues. Now, if there are any visiting members of council attending the meeting today, I encourage you to turn on your video so that we know that you are there. Um, when you want to speak and ask questions of staff. It also helps the clerk um, in um, recording attendance. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. <clears throat> We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none. Members, this is a special meeting of the Budget Committee. This is what we traditionally call the first wrap-up meeting of the 2022 Capital and Operating Budgets. We have two items that are on the agenda today. BU 44.1 2022 Capital and Operating Budgets and BU 44.2 2022 Operating Tax Rates and Related Matters. As we have done in previous years, I propose that we defer item BU 44.2 to our final wrap up meeting on February 7th next week. So members can ask questions and move motions on that item on the same day that we vote on the Budget Committee's recommendations to Executive Committee. All in favor of deferring BU 44.2 property tax tax rates and related matters to the final wrap up on February 7th. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Mr. Chair, if I can just make a comment. So, February 7th is next Friday. So, we have council Wednesday and Thursday. So, if we don't finish council, then we would probably have to come back on Friday. So, just keep that in mind. Oh, okay, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, you're right. If I can just interrupt, February seventh is on a Monday. Oh, it's Monday. Okay, you're it's right. The Monday it's Monday following council. Oh, sorry, I'm I'm looking at January. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no please. Thank it should you. Be all good. Okay, okay, great. Um, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the budget wrap-up notes that have been provided by the uh, CFO and Treasurer. Those wrap-up notes were made available online yesterday morning at Toronto.ca/council and to members of council on the clerk's meeting portal. I'll be referring to the wrap up notes as a guide for today's discussion. I'd also like to draw attention to members, uh, the public communications and submissions that have been sent to the budget committee over the course of the last three weeks. Communications from members of the public can be viewed in detail um, by members of council, of course, on the meeting portal as well. For BU, 44.1, uh, I'm going to begin by asking the Executive Director of Financial Planning, Steve Conforti, to lead us through the briefing note sections. Um, he's going to be uh, going through submissions from Toronto Public Health, the Accountability Offices, TTC, Police Services, and others, which are listed on the agenda at BU 44.1A through BU 44.1J. Um, he's going to be going through the briefing notes submitted for this meeting, uh, briefing notes that have been previously submitted to the budget, um, and he's going to go through the briefing notes that uh, have not been done but are expected to be submitted for February 7th budget meeting. Following that, as we have done in years past, uh, I'm going to go through a list of the service group areas and the agencies in the same order as our budget review meetings and ask if there's any additional questions of staff. Finally, I'm going to ask if there are any other questions of staff or requests of briefing notes that members can uh, speak to. And I want to remind you, if you have any motions, particularly motions uh, requesting briefing notes, that you submit them to the uh, clerk in writing as soon as possible. These motions, with your permission, will be shared with myself and the Executive Director of Financial Planning Division. With that said, I'd like to turn it over now to um, Steve Conforti, who's going to run us through the briefing notes. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Councillor. 
Uh, and uh, as Councillor Crawford mentioned, uh, there is the wrap-up notes that are available. Um, uh, makes this process a bit easier in terms of following through all of the different reports and briefing notes that we have. Uh, that can be found again on the city's budget website. Uh, if we look at all budget documents and look at the budget committee materials. So beginning uh, with section one, the supplementary reports uh, is item BU 44.1A. It's uh, the Toronto Public Health 2022 operating budget request. This is a report from the Medical Officer of Health. Um, uh, to note this, uh, the recommendations in this report are not consistent with the staff recommended budget currently before budget committee. Uh, the adjustments or adjustments that have been provided to city staff from Board of Health staff following uh, submission to the board, they include a uh, $600,000 adjustment to provincial funding, uh, a 1 million savings related to some lease savings with, uh, associated with modern TO, and adjustment to staffing based on uh, the school focused nurse uh, program expiring in 2022. EMP, and I'm just wondering if there's any way to maybe put this up on the uh, screen so we can just see that. So it may be a, seeing a double, but I just want to make sure everybody's clear on what we're what Steve's talking about. Is that possible to share this, Steve? Uh, or clerk? Yeah, I think we can. Uh, <laughs> we would just go page by page through, so we would just display it on the screen and uh, and follow yeah, through. Yeah, that would just. I think that would just be easier for number one for people watching. Um, but also, because members have it on their clerk's meeting portal, but it just may not be uh, evident okay. to everybody watching. Yeah, uh, we will. Uh, we'll um, we'll uh, get the uh, uh, the brief the wrap up notes up on the screen shortly. Yeah, similar to what we've done in years past, you just sort of do the run through so everybody can see it. I have just a quick question, Mr. Budget Chief. If yeah. it's okay while they're doing this. Sure. So just. It's more of a technical matter, so it would require an amendment to the proposed budget in order to reflect the um, the change in us from TP uh, from uh, the medical officer of health, correct? As I understand, yes. Here we go. Perfect. All right, thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there, I guess, if there's any questions. Um, yeah. I'm gonna call Officer Hope. Thanks, and if we can just toggle back to the, uh, so I can see everybody, there'd be a bit of a going back and forth here, I apologize, but it's probably easier. So are there any questions on the um, BU 44.1A? Oh, oh counts. Hold on. Let's go to outside. So let, let, we'll, we'll go a little bit slow here just to make sure I, I don't want to, we don't get too confused. So I, I saw outside counselors, Councillor Fletcher had some questions. Uh, so again, we're focusing on BU 44.1A um, and then we'll go to the next one, but just, the, just this first one. Councillor Fletcher, I saw your hand up. Oh, no, I'm just waving around here. Oh, okay. Just waving Thank high. You. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. How are you? Okay. Let's take it into committee. Then. I think Councillor Carroll, I saw your hand. Yes, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I may be asking a question that's just been explained, but I'm having CMP problems. So I was pretty right. uh, uh, distracted there. Um, I, I'm looking at the financial impact impact notes on the this public health item um, and, and wonder if you could just uh, uh, briefly explain the $1 million that goes to modern TO. Sure, thanks, Councillor. Um, uh, I can start, and I believe we have Althea Hutchinson, who's on the call as well, that may be able to elaborate. Um, essentially, following the submission to the Public Health Board, uh, there was identified uh, some lease savings associated with uh, some of the modern TO initiatives, and it's just a reflection of those savings. Well, lease savings. Okay. So, so... I, I, Okay, so what? So so public health has the lease savings, and so so uh, um, the one million gross net is is their property tax.
portion budget going down or is that a or is that a, a cost shared savings like savings to both yeah so that that's part of the property tax portion shared going down uh, as part of the model for modern TO, those savings are then applied to help support the actual capital initiative. So what we have is an offsetting increase in our contributions to be able to support the capital investment that would reside uh, within the city's corporate expenditure accounts. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Thanks for that. Mr. Chair, you're on mute, I believe. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Sorry, I thought Yes, thank you very much. In the cost sharing agreement with the province, I remember this being an issue before. I'm I'm not sure if it still is. The 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 cost share percentages, are they annualized? Like does does what we actually pay our employees for the cost shared programs reflect what the cost share is? I just I, I remember at some point in time our salary increases weren't reflected in the provincial contributions. I'm just wondering if that had been resolved. So through the chair, um, we the we continue to have the exact same issue that we've had uh, before, where uh, cost increases related to salaries are being funded from 2019. They are being funded fully uh, fully by the city through the tax. So, so how much money would that would that be total? Um, if I would need a minute just to look that up, if you don't mind. If you could, like this is money the province owes us um, that it, it like to deliver services they have asked us to deliver. So it would be nice to know just what that what that number is and how much more we're funding than they should be funding. Like, is it, it if it doesn't have six zeros next to it, then I'm not as concerned. How would it be in that realm? Althea, perhaps if you could just e email it to me, that would be, yeah, that would be helpful. Or you know what? I'm just going to ask at the final wrap up. Perfect. Oh, beautiful. Thank you very That's much. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Okay. Next, Steve. Okay, great. So uh, moving to item BU 44.1B, uh, again from the Toronto Public Health. This is the 2022 to 2031 capital budget and plan request. Uh, the request, again, is not consistent with the staff recommended budget. The difference in this case is uh, adjustments to the carry forward expectations uh, as it relates to capital projects included in the plan. Questions? I think we're good on that one. Steve, next. Mm -hmm. Item BU 44.1C, it's the Auditor General's Office 2022 Operating Budget. Uh, please note within the recommendations we have identified, uh, there's a typo, it should read 7.729 million gross and 7.658 million net. Uh, this budget is consistent with what's included in the staff recommended operating budget. Questions? I have a question, but not about the budget note, just process. Sorry, if you'll indulge me for a second. Yeah, the yeah, briefing sure, notes sure. are written as different numbers on the website. So how do we, how did they relate to each other? Steve, can you answer that at all? Sure. So uh, this first section that we're going through are our, uh, our staff reports or reports coming from various boards or agencies for consideration by budget committee. Uh, in the next section, we'll get into the briefing notes. The briefing okay. notes are, are numbered. Um, basically from one to, I believe, 18, based on when they've been uh, submitted and made available to budget committee for review. So, sorry, the ones you're putting now, where would are they either, be posted? These ones are, are staff reports that have been submitted to budget committee, uh, and uh, they're part of our uh, of the budget committee So I can find those ones on CMP then? Uh, these ones would be available on Timis. Uh, I believe okay. they may also be on our budget website, but I'd have to verify. Okay. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure I know which ones are where. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Okay. I think we're asking um, EU 44.1C. Is that correct? Just want to make sure. Yeah. Yep. Any question? Yep. With the, which is the AG's operating budget? It's consistent with the staff budget at this point. So if there's any questions, seeing none. Okay. We'll go on to the next. Sure. 
So the next item is BU 44.1D, and this is the Omnibus in Toronto's operating and capital plan. Uh, what we have in front of us is consistent with what's included in the staff recommended budget. Okay, um, seeing no questions. Members, just, uh, okay, there we go. We're going back and forth. So if you, um, if I don't recognize you, just uh, unmute yourself and let me know because I can't always see the screen in front of me, but I don't think there are any questions on the ombudsman's, oh, Councillor Carroll, sorry. Yeah, just, just to be clear, because it, it you know, it, it, when we're looking at this, um, I'm seeing no impact to staff, no impact to staff recommended, but these actually aren't staff recommended budgets. Are the, are the, the gross amounts I'm looking at for the budget, are those what the ombudsman submitted to budget? No changes have been made to what was submitted by the ombudsman? Yeah, that's correct. So in the financial impact, okay. when we note that there's no impact, uh, what we mean by that is that what is being, what's presented in this report is consistent with what's included in the staff recommended budget. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Thank you. Okay, great. Next, Steve. The next item is BU 44.1E, uh, Office of the Integrity Commissioner, the 2022 operating budget. Again, uh, this budget is consistent with what's included in the staff recommended operating budget. Questions? Seeing none, okay, let's go on to the next. Sure, and it's BU 44.1F, uh, Toronto Lobbyist Registrar, uh, 2022 operating budget and the 10-year capital plan. And again, this is consistent with what's included in the staff recommended budget. Thank you. Seeing no questions, on to the next, or hearing no questions. So the next item is BU 44.1G. So this is the Toronto Transit Commission's 15 year capital investment plan and 10 year capital budget and plan. Uh, what is included uh, in this report is consistent with what's included in the staff recommended capital program. Questions, seeing none. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Budget Chief. Um, so my question is, there's been a lot of discussion in the past week, week and a half about the TTC budget and the lack of investment uh, to, to achieve the um, Transform TO goals as set out in the December Transform TO document, the net zero by 2040 document. Um, I'm wondering if staff have had an opportunity to kind of digest what it might take to achieve the additional funding recommendation that came out of that document and to help us achieve the goal of, I think it's 1500 new buses. Uh, my understanding based on questions is what will take a long time is siting and building out maintenance facilities. Do we have an idea of what we would need to put in the budget next year or, or sorry, this year in order for us to start the work to achieve that goal. So thanks, uh, Councillor Thiz Chair. Uh, we have Josie Levita available from the TTC to respond. Thanks, Josie. Good morning. Uh, so through the chair, uh, I believe we're working uh, on the briefing note with uh, the Environment and Energy uh, Division that's coming, I think, to the next meeting where that request has been identified. And I know that at our last meeting, uh, Ben Case was uh, part of that. And I think the request for, was for us to take that away and bring that as part of the briefing note. So work is underway, Councillor Layton, uh, to try to identify that, I think, in response to the briefing note request. So we're working Thank on you so much. Thanks, Josie. That's my last question. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Okay, Steve, seeing none, let's move on. Okay, great. Uh, so the next item is BU 44.1H. So this is the TTC's 2022 operating budget. Uh, of note, the operating budget is not consistent with what's in front of you from the staff recommended budget. And the difference is um, uh, following the TTC submission to the board, uh, there was considerations of the impact from the Omicron variant. And uh, through the staff recommended budget and working with the TTC, uh, there's an additional uh, roughly $100 million impacts associated with uh, the estimated uh, impacts of the Omicron variant. Any 
questions. Just so we're crystal clear, it's $100 million more that we would need, and the expectation is we would be asking for it from the federal government, federal and provincial governments, correct? Yes, through the, through the chair. So when we identify the $1.4 billion in total COVID impacts, that includes the, the adjustment that was made in the TTC budget, reflecting an added financial impact of $100 million. And But the added finance, so this isn't a request for better service, this is just the cost associated with the loss of revenue. That's correct. I'm just wondering when we get to uh, turn over the numbers on the overall city budget to 15 billion, because we, if, if I'm not mistaken, we were about 100 million shy, so. Councillor. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Do I see Councillor Carroll with questions? No, you're good, okay. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, the next item is BU 44.1I, uh, and this is a report from the city manager on uh, Toronto local appeal body uh, variable decision rates. Uh, the financial impacts included in this report are included within the 2022 operating budget and is consistent with what's before council. Seeing and hearing no questions, let's check. Okay. Next, thanks, Steve. Continue. All right. Uh, item BU 44.1J is the Toronto Police Service and Services uh, Board 2022 budget request. Uh, this is not consistent with what's in front of you from the staff recommended budget, with the, the adjustment being a technical adjustment in nature, uh, where the expected federal and provincial support for 17.9 million in COVID impacts. Uh, is residing in the city's corporate revenue budget as opposed to it uh, being included in the police budget as reflected in this report. So if we have questions, Councillor Crawford, for police, like we can wait and we're going to do them again on the end, at the end? Or yeah, so we'll, there will be an opportunity. These are specifically okay. to dealing with this particular um, um, cut. I think that's in, yeah, but there will be an opportunity to ask overall questions of the police budget as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carroll, I see your hand up. Yeah, uh, walk me through this. Because um, uh, I'm looking at the financial impact statement. So, you know, I haven't read the full report. So, how does this change? How does this change the property tax increase to the to the uh, police budget? Is this this is simply a federal ad adjustment? The the property tax the the request of the city's funding is exactly the same. Yes, that's correct. So this is really just a technical adjustment. So the approach that city staff have taken in terms of managing uh, expected COVID uh, support funding is we're recording all of the the support funding, be it uh, related to transit operations, shelters. Uh, or any city program or agency, it's being collected and recorded within our city's corporate revenues accounts. So this is just a technical adjustment to, to maintain that consistent approach. Okay. So, but so this adjustment, it, it's a it's a straight in out, or is the gross amount going up, but our our city net is staying the same? Uh, from a citywide perspective, there is no change. It's just where we're reflecting those expected revenues. Okay. Okay. And they were embedded as 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 the budget that we were looking at during the the public review. That's correct. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. I think we're good for the next. Okay, so the next item is. Oh, sorry. So that's the end of the reports. Uh, we're now moving into section two, which is the briefing notes that were submitted for uh, today's budget committee wrap up. So again, uh, all of the briefing notes are available. Uh, either there's the links available on, on the wrap up note document, um, or they're available on the city's website. Uh, if you look into all budget documents, there's a, a tab there for briefing notes specifically, and they're all numbered uh, as referenced here. So uh, I'll begin walking us through each of the different briefing notes, starting with uh, the briefing notes submitted today uh, for today's meeting from Community and Social Services. The first one is briefing note number nine from Parks, Forestry and Recreation. Uh, this is a briefing note related to the capital program. 
uh, titled Indoor and Outdoor Skating and Cricket Investments in the 2022 to 2031 Staff Recommended Capital Budget and Plan for Parks, Forestry and Recreation. Hi. Uh, Councilor McKelvey, you have that was your brief note, so you have some questions. So I just, I know in you know 2019 I asked for this, and I think in 2020 I asked for this, and 2021 I think I asked for this, and I have to go back to find all of those briefing notes, but I feel like many of these projects have been pushed out further because I remember in 2019 them being in the 10 year plan and now they're, you know, in 2030 or 2031. So how are we locking these down so they're not just shifting every year? Because every year my residents ask, when are we getting more skating rinks and cricket ring or cricket? And then every year it's moved out another few years. And then, and, and I'm, I have to pull all those, but I mean, that's that's kind of my strong recollection for, for some of these. So maybe you can just kind of speak to that and I'll follow up afterwards on how many have been pushed back. Sure, thanks for the question, uh, Councillor McKelvey, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm actually gonna ask Anne-Marie to, uh, to pipe in around uh, what the, the sort of, um, uh, what's been delayed or what's been uh, re-established within the budget. There is smoothing and variance reporting that happens every year based on our ability to spend, but I think Anne Marie can likely answer more specifically. And I'd also like to say this is the round of her last budget committee meeting, so. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so we, um, so in some cases, uh, with respect to some of the error, we did actually have to find uh, and plan for them in parks. So it did take a bit. Um, it did take a year longer for us to uh, land one of the errors, which is going to be advancing into Fountainhead Park, for example. So we are uh, addressing kind of the engagement and dealing with the competing uses around parks and and getting some of the engagement uh, involved so that has resulted in it. Um, also, we, um, we've we had to look at our budget in terms of our capacity to spend and some of the, um, and some of our ability to move these projects forward and have the available funding tools um, that we're addressing. Um, so that has um, also impacted. Um, we've also been looking at putting some of the money towards some of our state of good repair for some of the arenas that um, have been um, impacted by state of good repair. So there has been, I'm I'm not saying that there hasn't been some delays, but we are making best efforts to advance the um the ICE um uh, ICE work program and um and we're hoping to be able to stay on target around uh where we planned uh as submitted in the 2022 budget. So I mean I understand that like you know 20 as you get closer maybe you're you're off because it took a little longer to to find the location but I'm talking about the ones that were like 10 years out and they're still 10 years out. Um, if I can through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I think Councilman probably we'd have to do a deeper dive into the budget to track back the the types of items that you're uh, that you're asking about uh, and that would require a bit more of a detailed review around what you know was potentially delayed and. Or, or not, um, if you could leave that with us, we can take it offline and send you some of that information prior to the next meeting. Okay, we've also like, added I'll look to, to find that as well, but like, I know in 2019, sending people notes saying, you know, it's in the 10 year plan, but now if it's in 2030 or 2031, that's like been pushed a couple of years on the back end. So we've also had to add a, a more budget per air because of the costs that have gone up. And that was when we were prepared this budget and we will have to reevaluate that for, for next year. Um, the other piece is, as you know, we're going through our growth funding tools and um, we can only basically um, put forward uh, projects when we do have the projected money and capacity to spend. So as some of our capital items get more expensive um, and we have to increase those budgets that does come with some smoothing and pushing uh, pushing out some projects in order to address those expenditures on the current ones that we are advancing and tendering so there is there is as there is it's it's kind of like an ecosystem when one when one changes it does have a ripple effect overall in the budget all of our items in our budget are pending um, available capital funds and are projected for section 42 for development charges and um, potentially for CBC, depending on how, how that gets constructed. So, but we can, we can look at where we've, where we've seen the, the push and pull and get back to you on that counselor. 
Okay, so then to that, if it is dependent on these, you know, section 37, section 42, and we don't know the locations and it's, you know, if I have a development today, you're not getting those funds for five or six years. So how are you conveying or, or finding those projects? Because um, inevitably they'll always be later than you think they're coming in, right? Well, we are actively looking for significantly earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and we are actively planning for locations for some of those projects. We've been doing that work with with parks and and looking at those opportunities and sites. Um, so we um, we are we are advancing that. And then um, uh, generally, we don't do engagement until it's within um, a year or two of actual construction because and I'm around okay, that. Got it. I, sorry, I'm out of time, so I'm going to cut you off there because I just want to squeeze in one more um, for cricket. You yeah. have you say here there's going to be 5 20 23 24 26 28 20 30 what do you have for locations on those because those are things where people could be actively trying to get you know section 37 42 etc um yeah so what if what's been identified for locations and sorry for thank you for your indulgence mr chair on the time no worries um we will we can we can in order to uh respect the committee's time we can um look we can get back to we have identified through the cricket strategy uh, we have identified priority uh, fields for um, basically advancing in the next, uh, the ones identified in the next couple of years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton. So just remark, I love the name cricket strategy, but it may have overlap uh, with a strategy from the biodiversity strategy. There's a cricket strategy there too. Um, just, just really quickly, uh, Councillor McKevley raises some really good points about um, the, the, inequitable distribution of, uh, of uh, recreational facilities. Um, is it safe to say that prior to amalgamation, the per capita rink to, to resident ratio was higher in the old city than it was in the suburban areas? So through, through the speaker, I'll, I'll start and, and Renee may wish to add, but um, if, if uh, Council and Budget Committee remembers the facilities master plan, which was approved by Council, uh, three or four years ago was was meant to address that exact issue that you've brought up, Councillor Layton. So it looked at the historical uh, sort of provision of facilities right across the city and certainly did uh, recognize that all of the former municipalities that came into the new city of Toronto had different uh, priorities and different facility provision rates. And the facilities master plan established citywide provision rates for all of those facilities with a strategy to try and equalize or, you know, create an equity approach. And that's why you see, you know, some community center development uh, in areas of the city that have, of, of this city of Toronto that have been historically uh, absent from that level of development. You'll also see some level of provisions, which is over, over provided from, a, a, you know, from what would be a, a citywide provision rate. And you're correct. Uh, the old city of Toronto and the old city of Etobicoke had a remarkably high number of outdoor rinks that created a very, very high provision rate. But but since amalgamation, the investment in new, not, not state of good repair, but in new rinks, outdoor rinks, has, hasn't been in the old city or south of Tobacco, has generally speaker, speaking been in areas that have been underserved. Through the, through the speaker, that's correct. You'll see some refurbishment and some state of good repair of the existing uh, rinks, uh, but many and uh, just about all of the new rinks, unless they've been replacement for aging infrastructure, have all been in areas of the city that historically has been under provided for that amenity. D despite the fact that, generally speaking, the population growth in the city, particularly in the downtown core, has been far exceeded some of the other communities in in the city, right? So, so to the speaker, maybe you're not the right. I, well, I mean, the population is, is uh, you know, the density downtown certainly has, has grown significantly, but there are also items uh, from the facility master plan that are, that are higher than what a regular provision would be, rate would be in some areas of the city. So, even with, you know, even with that growth. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I just had w one question about the cricket strategy. Uh, the, is there any hope for integrating kind of a shared facility with uh, parks that have multiple baseball diamonds. I thought that Eglinton Park had one of those. I'm just like, there's no chance of a new cricket facility in the downtown core unless it's part of a shared facility. Um, and if there are ways to better integrate them downtown for a faster uptake, I'm thinking like not Confederation Park, but the waterfront uh, back to back baseball diamonds 
may be able to accommodate uh, off Lakeshore, that may be able to accommodate a cricket pitch. It's not my ward, so it's easy for me to say. Um, but there, there, if there are options like that, I'd encourage you to bring them forward because despite the fact that the baseball lobby is quite strong and we support them and, and hope for the best for them, um, we do uh, with even just one downtown cricket pitch on an existing facility uh, might be a really easy way for us to check a box and uh, allow for some play in an area that doesn't currently permit it. So through the yes. speaker, I'll, I'll uh, and Henry may, like to, may, may want to add as well, but I, I think what, what you're uh, suggesting, Councillor Layton, is exactly the strategy that Henry and her group is, is looking at. I think it requires, and this is the, the work that is that is underway right now, a real uh, sort of analysis of the usage of various fields across the city uh, with, with the view to looking at ones that are underutilized uh, and, and geographically in the appropriate area so that they can be either converted or a, a sort of a joint use facility, so to speak, with uh, with a whole bunch of options around how the, the field is utilized. Do you want to add to that, Emery? Yeah, we've also heard loud and clear from the cricket, uh, various cricket users, both more more organized and less organized, that you know just having uh, practice opportunities in parks is what they're looking for versus having like the formal pitch. So we're looking at those opportunities too. So there is some really good alignment on existing parks and allows for kind of more what I would call recreational. Um, and so we're definitely looking at that and we are looking at the assets to see where it can be shared. Um, and also trying to identify real, real pitches with, you know, better kind of field and upkeep so that, um, and dispersing those a little bit more across the city. So that is also something that we are looking at and reusing some of the areas where we're not even permitting some of those uh, baseball uh, and or mini, mini fields um, and turning them into cricket is something that we are also looking at. So it's been and a great just engagement. As, just as a suggestion, if you bring the stakeholders in, the way to the baseballers' hearts, and I know this because I deal a lot with Christy Pitts, is improved field, improved facilities if they have to take on someone else on the field, they I think that they might um, that might attract them to such an arrangement of overall if we're bringing the standard up because it's it's getting more use. Conversation for another time. Thank you. Thank yeah, you to the speaker. Those are good suggestions too. Thank you, Councilman Nunziata. Yeah, just a question. Um, <clears throat> so most of these um, outdoor um, skating rinks, they're they're community led, correct? That so through the, through, the, through the speaker, there's there's a, a few different types of, uh, of outdoor skating opportunities. There's the city operated artificial ice rinks that you see in I think over 55 parks across the city. And there's also a natural ice rink program that um, Councilman Nunziata is what you may be referring to, which is led by community volunteers. It usually takes place in parks property, whether it's baseball diamond or tennis court or a parking lot. Uh, and the city provides some resources and training to the community, but it's largely led and maintained by community volunteers. And there's about a hundred of those across the city. Right, because I'm working, I, I know I've worked a couple in my ward, but just on that point where you have the community led, um, so the city provides the training, uh, but we don't provide the um, the boards right around. Through the, the speaker, we, we have, we, you we don't have provide not Boards. No. We have not provided the boards that hasn't been part of the program, mostly because it's a volunteer led program uh, and there's all, all kinds of other sort of uh, items that go along with uh, implementing that type of infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, I think you're not waving this time. Yeah, yeah I was waving. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to understand a bit more uh, about arenas and how many arenas are there in each of the community council areas, um, which is different than an outdoor ice rink? Or... Now, I understand that in Scarborough previously, that the outdoor arenas were covered and put inside a building. So are those arenas like the Ted Reeve Arena, which is near me, or the Side Arena, are those the same types of facilities? So through, through the speaker and apologies, uh, Councillor Fletcher, we'd have to do a little bit of work to come up with the by community council. We're happy to follow up with you on that. I, I, yeah. I, oh, wait, just. I, I do have that. Oh, okay. Well, let me just finish that. The, sure. the, I mean, the other pieces, um, 
that in certain parts of the city, as you're likely aware, Councilor Fletcher, there's also arena boards and arena boards of management, which are city owned facilities, but operated right. uh, through an arena board and they very much provide you know, ice to the community, uh, you know, very similar to the way the city would provide. So that analysis would have to include those arena boards of management as well. So over to you, Henry. Um, yes, uh, in terms of the numbers that I have is that there's, um, in terms of indoor ice provision, there's 65 overall in the city with 37 in Etobicoke, York, 34 in North York, 23 in Scarborough and nine in Toronto, East York. And those are outdoor, so indoor they're outdoor or indoor arena? indoor so um and then there's a number of outdoor rinks so i think it's really important when we're talking about rinks that we talk about the nature of them mm -hmm. because there are there's indoor ones where yep. no yes. problem with the weather and then there's <laughs> outdoor ones where they're totally weather dependent and of course this winter is great for outdoor <laughs> but we've had winters that Basically, it's almost a, uh, a swimming pool, not a skating rink. So if you don't mind always making those delineations, Mr. Chair, I would just ask that we're a little more careful when we're talking about the kinds of rinks. There seem to be three or four. There's all of the rinks are owned by the city. Some of them are run by an arena board. Some of them, uh, these are indoor rinks, indoor rinks owned by the city, some by an arena board, some by just run by PFNR, so there's a differentiation there. And then we have outdoor rinks that are run by PFNR, and then we have outdoor rinks that are run by the community. And too often we just talk about rinks, and there's sometimes availability, I think you would agree, Ms. Romoff, to be able to mix and match, or there's already a site to be able to put an outdoor community rink or an outdoor skating trail or something of that nature. But I wouldn't want anyone to think that it wasn't pretty well distributed and there's a lot of cover, I'll call them covered or indoor rinks that the city actually, city owns them all, but that we directly operate, correct? Speaker, yep, you're correct. And I would add, as you just mentioned, the fifth type of rink, which is a, a skating trail. Which oh, is very trail, much, that's right. Right, okay. which, is, which I, I should say is also something that is really gaining in popularity and is a sort of capital need that we're addressing and trying to implement wherever we have the space uh, to when we're when we're building these types of things. Uh, so just in yes, which but it it's a um, it's got a compressor. It's artificially made cold, so it's not a natural rink. It's got to be that's correct. somewhere where you have that operation already underway. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. And then just around the question that Councillor Layton asked about cricket and baseball, uh, I do know McCleary Park has that too. It's got two big diamonds and it's also a cricket field. Are there any issues with that and of any kind? And is there any, uh, as in terms of um, competing needs or operationally where there might be issues based on turf, what happens with turf and what would the what would the optimal size be of a space that could host both baseball and cricket? So I'll, I'll start through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, to you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, I think instead of identifying fields, I think, you know, Anne-Marie would agree that the, the team is working on identifying those fields and those options with the cricket task force right now. Uh, so I wouldn't want to speak specifically to any, any one particular field yet. But as far as the uh, the space requirements to your question, I'm going to ask Anne Marie or one of her staff to answer if they have that specific information. I'm I'm getting the information on the space. So if we can't answer it with a, and disrespecting your time, Councillor, um, through the chair. Um, oh, it's 120 by 120 for cricket. I'm assume, assuming that I'll, I'll see what what the uh, measurement is, the number. Um, and in terms of, of McCleary, it's actually something that um, we wanted to, to speak with you about because there's a great opportunity in McCleary to basically have a, a combined use there. Um, but um, it's something that has come, come forward. Um, and then as Councillor Layton noted, um, the idea of doing the full field improvement um, so that there can be um, a joint use is, is great, but we do try and focus on the diamonds that maybe are not the pr premium diamonds and right. heavy users. So that's something that um, that has come up. So that's 120 so, yeah. years, 120 McCleary years. is a 
not a premium, but I think it's a class A, so that could be a but anyway, yeah. they do play cricket there. Can you just tell me 120 by 120? What's that? Is it a quarter of an acre? Is it uh, an acre? Ask? Let's go to it's acres. Big. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd have to get my calculator out, Councillor, but I will be happy to send that in an email. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, seeing no other questions. Oh, one more, Councillor. What? It's uh, Councillor Wongtan. Oh, I didn't see. Okay, you popped into my screen now. Okay, great. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to just ask a couple of quick questions regarding the Moss Park Arena, um, and uh, with respect to. The, the major Moss Park revitalization, I know that's going to take, um, you know, several years out. And of course, we still have the, the big question of how the impact of the construction of the Ontario line is going to impact our efforts to rebuild the entire Moss Park campus. Um, the, the Moss Park arena right now has this uh, dilemma where the outdoor elements are coming into the building. So we were talking about outdoor and indoor rink. The outside weather is coming into the arena. And I'm just curious to know, um, in the uh, in the state of uh, uh, of sort of uh, capital backlog, um, is this part of it's not not capital backlog, but a state of good repair? Um, are there funds allocated specifically to make the building safe and to prevent the further flooding and the penetration of water coming through the roof? And can we get that work done in 2022? Um, through the chair, uh, councillor, um, I'd have to confirm. I know that a number of issues were brought forward by the Moss Park Board. I know that our capital staff did respond uh, to those inquiries and some of the matters that they thought were not included would be included. Our priority is always making sure that the integrity of the building and this issue of water uh, penetration is obviously related to that over um, other types of state of good repair. Um, items, so I'm happy to go and confirm what the um, what that scope of work is and to address that because that would be a priority for us, um, Councillor. Okay, thank you. That that is a very helpful question. I, I think the the experience we have right now is that because there's the uncertainty in the timeline of what the Moss Park revitalization looks like, which is still probable. I mean, we all know it's going to be several years out, but in the meantime, um, over the past three years, the deterioration of building has accelerated. And I don't think we can wait. So trying to save that money, which I think might have been the earlier thinking, um, I think that that window has passed. So is there money in the state of good repair budget for Moss Park um, if we need to make it safe, make it weatherproof? Just some very basic things that we're looking for here. We have about 1.275 million uh, for state of good repair in Moss Park. Um, and once again, I would look at those items and check in with staff to ensure that um, that money is sufficient to what you are saying. And yes, the state of good repair challenges with Moss Park we are being facing in other arenas and with all of our facilities, unfortunately, we do have a significant backlog and that's reflected in the budget constraints that we've submitted as part of our 2022 the 2031 capital budget. Okay, thank you. And because it's taken so long for um, staff uh, to respond to the Moss Park Arena Board and their manager, uh, would it speed things up by way of reallocating those funds? And of course, building based on a building uh, conditions assessment that you would agree to, and and work um, uh, repair work that would be uh, supervised uh, and probably overseen by PFR staff. Would you agree to the transfer of funds to the Moss Park Arena Board just so they can get the contracts out the door quicker as opposed to waiting for another year or, or potentially two or longer while the water continues to penetrate through the roof? Council, so, okay. the, con the contracts are being advanced um, and I'll let Jenny answer the other, other questions. No, I was just, I, I just going to say that, I, I mean, we will undertake the work as, as quickly as we can. What you're suggesting, Councillor, is, is really uh, a different relationship management uh, approach with the arena boards. And, and I, I think it's something that we would have to confer with the city manager's office on as they're the sort of accountability and relationship uh, management approach with the arena boards. But I, I, I can't I can say that, you know, that, that would be an irregular type of agreement if, if that's what we would go forward with. And we would have to be uh, really, really ensured that the, the work will be completed and that the work will be completed based on the city standards. I, I should say, you know, to, to, to follow up with Anne Marie's comments, if there are any health and safety or, or dangerous uh, conditions at any of our arenas, including the Moss Park Arena, we reprioritize our capital budget around that to make sure that the facilities themselves 
are safe and that the participants and staff in those buildings are not at risk at all. So I, I think that's still work that is underway. And uh, and and once uh, we have further meetings with the Moss Park Board, I think we can connect with you directly around what some of the options are. Uh, Janie, thank you. I, I think it's best for you folks to go down there and take a look. Um, there is significant yeah, sure. pooling and, and flooding. So I think my final question is, is, is sort of AOC related, if I can just sort of draw it out the line. So with the 519, which is an AOC, uh, very similar to the Board of Management with Moss Park, we have transfer funds um, through Section 37 and other, other dollars to their board, which they then manage their capital repair. Um, so we have done this before. Is this not possible for, for us to do it here in the Moss Park Arena in so case staff don't get to the work in time? Through, through, through the speaker, very different accountability and relationship management framework uh, from the AOCs to, to the arena boards of management. So, I, I, I mean, with respect, I, I think that's really a question that would have to be uh, referred to the city manager's office for follow up. Okay. Or thank to, you. And to SDFA thank for follow up as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I think we have no more questions, Steve. Let's try the next one. All right, great. Uh, so the next briefing note um, is briefing note number 17 in your packages, uh, again, from Parks, Forestry and Recreation, uh, and this is referring to the ravine strategy. Questions? I do believe we're good. Okay, next. Uh, briefing note number 15 within your packages from senior services and long term care on the operating budget uh, titled city's proposed approach to emotional uh, emotion centered care and associated costs. Councillor Carroll, do you ask for this one? Thank you. Yes, I did. Thanks for this. Uh, so, uh, uh, I've got the clarity now on the difference between the, the province is touting that they're, they're funding this thing and providing the additional staff. But I, I now have your information that in fact, we're providing 22% of the cost of that staff. Um, and I'm wondering, um, does that include benefit costs or is that just their, their, uh, their, uh, ship salaries? Uh, thank you very much for the question and through the chair that does um, include the benefits. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's 22%. Uh, we're funding 22% of the all in whole whack. Um, and, and, and I ask about benefits because this is the kind of work where, where th there's a lot of workplace injury. They often are claiming benefits, aren't they? Um, well, sorry, go ahead. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, uh, through the chair, I wasn't sure if that, that was a question or just a statement. <laughs> I suppose it was a question that was somewhat, somewhat rhetorical. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to ask then is, you know, they're providing a certain amount. If this program is success, where do we go from there? Will there be any more support from the, the uh, provincial government? Uh, uh, will, uh, will we be at the mercy of their schedule of if they want to expand this program or across the province? Okay. Uh, so through the chair, um, as you know, the, uh, increase in direct care hours is incremental over the next 4 years. So we're, and obviously anticipating that there is going to be ongoing funding. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, sector is undergoing, um, a, a much needed transformation right now. Uh, we're looking at changes to regulation. Uh, we're looking at uh, national standards coming in place for long-term care. And uh, there has been a lot of uptake and a lot of focus on the need to actually have uh, emotion uh, uh, focused models of care within long-term care. Um, and uh, I know that there is a significant interest from the ministry as well as some of the associations that support um, the sector. Um, and so I'm, ex I'm anticipating that uh, there will need to be uh, funding um, from the province in order uh, ongoing in order to help us uh, help to support to spread this um, across the province. Right. And, and this last question, I meant to, to put this in the briefing note and, and forgot it at the time. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, advocacy going forward in, in growing the emotion centered uh, model. Um, uh, yeah, I'm wondering if there's a, um, an opportunity uh, working with AMO. 
um, our other municipally run uh, our other municipally run long term care throughout the province are they a focus of implementing this strategy as well or is it a mixture of our city run and and privately run that are that are starting this right off the bat right uh, uh, through uh, through the chair um i am not uh, 100% sure what other um what other uh, um Sorry, locations are, <clears throat> are currently doing. However, we are uh, planning to uh, evaluate our model um, that we're piloting. And of course, if it is successful, it will demonstrate uh, the return on investment for uh, other municipalities who are actually uh, paying attention to you know, what we're doing currently. Okay, great. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to question. and and. Just to flag for you, my, my main concern here is that we start this and then my main concern is the operating outlook for 23, 24, 25. And so uh, just to, to flag for you, what, what I may do is, is meet with Ms. Dockery and then move a motion to do with gathering the information we may need for the out year advocacy um, at our, our final budget session in council. But it, it will not be anything that has a financial impact. And I agree. I've actually had those conversations with Jennifer myself, so I think. Oh, super. Okay. Yeah, so we've, 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 I think we've both been talking at the same time on this council, so I think it's a good idea. On okay. The, well, and then I'll also have a conversation with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, seeing other questions, let's go on to, I think we have another uh, long-term care one. Yeah. So briefing note uh, number 16, uh, again, from senior services and long-term care on the operating budget, uh, which is the breakdown of government funding formula between base and new positions supporting the emotion-centered care model. Breakdown on the costs. Councilor Kerry, you good with that one? Uh, okay. Yeah. Great note. Uh, it's the, exactly the information I needed, but I don't need to ask any additional questions. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Onwards. Sure. The next briefing note is uh, number 14 from uh, Shelter Support and Housing Administration on the operating budget uh, allocation uh, for providing free menstrual and incontinence products in shelters. Council, we'll start with Councilor Juan Tam, then go to Carol after that. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, and uh, through you to hi, Gord Tanner, nice to see you. Um, I'm just curious to know, Gord, uh, with respect to the allowance that the city provides to shelters and 24 hour respites and 24 hour, uh, um, uh, uh, even the hotel motel programs, the, the current um, use of menstrual products and incontinence products, is that factored into just basic toiletries for, for shelter and, uh, and, and, and users of those facilities? How does that, how do you break that down? Uh, thanks, and through the chair, councillor, um, it, it would have been included in the uh, that that sort of supplies for clients before 2019. But in 2019, um, through your support, uh, we did enhance the budget uh, to the tune of 200 and um, you know 20 thousand uh, dollars. Uh, to provide a specific line item to support uh, shelter providers with menstrual products, and that has been flowed since uh, 2019. Uh, thank you, Gord. And because um, another issue has a, has arisen during the budget process, we've been made aware that um, that some of those dollars are not enough, especially if it covers the more expensive product known as sort of quote unquote adult diapers, the incontinence mm -hmm. products. Um, the how how often are you hearing? Uh, if at all, from from your service providers that they need additional dollars to make up for what seems to be a shortfall uh, for basic toiletries for, for their patrons. Uh, through the chair, councillor, so each year, every shelter provider, respite center, 24-hour drop-in submits a budget to SSHA uh, to cover their operating costs, and that's inclusive of uh, supplies for people using their services. So uh, we look at those budgets each year and and we'll make uh, adjustments to fund those services. Within the within the last year and just since requesting the briefing note, it's included there. Um, we've looked at our directly operated sites to give you a, a sense of of how those supplies are used in some of our city operated shelters, um, where where you know we're supporting for the most part people who are are seniors. Uh, and that comes to a total of $37,000. Uh, 
Um, we haven't heard directly uh, from our other shelter providers, but certainly this is part of the standards that we have uh, for both uh, shelters and respite centers that incontinence products are included. Um, and, and we'll take this here to further the conversation with those shelter providers to make sure that they are uh, able to provide those supports and, and are able to fund them within their budgets. Uh, thank you. And, and Gord, uh, with respect to the, the drop-in centers, the ones that are not 24-hour operated, but there is a patchwork of 50-plus of, um, uh, of these facilities, uh, I'm just curious to know the relationship that the city has with these organizations and whether or not they've brought up the issue around incontinent products and menstrual products uh, with your office. Uh, through the chair, councillor, it hasn't come to my attention, but I'm certainly happy to to further that conversation with our drop-in providers. Um, we do provide a, a number of uh, drop-ins funding for a range of services, including food and and, and other supports. Um, the other piece I think that's that's helpful and included in the note is that individuals, uh, you know, can access some additional funding through their income supports for these products. And so perhaps there's more we can do to make sure people know about that funding that is available and that we can support individuals to access that enhanced funding. But happy to take that question uh, back to the sector and and understand more more fully, you know, what the needs around incontinence products are within the drop-in sector. Thank you. Um, because time is going to be running short, and um, uh, the one of the uh, I guess lead staff persons from the Toronto Drop-in Network, Diana Chan McNally, uh, has uh, spoken at the budget pro uh, budget deputations and highlighted this as a as a concern. I know that she has been working with the the network to determine what would be an estimated number of of, of uh, a quantum of need in order for them to supply their their patrons with these products. Uh, would you be willing to work with her and the drop in network leading up to the final decision of council for budget to see if we can actually make sure that there's an, uh, a proper number that we can advance to um, to fund these uh, sort of essential products. Is that something that you'd agree to? Yeah, through the councillor, uh, sorry, through the chair, councillor, we, uh, you know, work closely with the Toronto Drop-In Network, uh, of which uh, Diane is a part, and certainly happy to have those continued conversations with her. Um, you know, I think we want to support wherever we can individuals' autonomy with respect to these supplies. So if they can access more funding through their income support program to to gain access to these products, that would certainly be one one thing we want to work on. But happy to work with. Uh, Diana, to understand what what that gap might be, and and to determine what the quantum of the need might be, also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think Councillor Carroll, you had a question. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, yes. It's as, as Councillor Wong Tam has already pointed out. This is this is another one of those things where we we, we have a plan and a distribution for this, but but. Suddenly, by surprise, uh, people showed up at at public deputation uh, deputation uh, days, and and highlighted an issue that that we thought had a management plan, and 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 yet it uh, it seems not to be serving. I was trying really hard to grab onto the names of of places where where the examples came from, but and I think it's I think it's a lot. Um, uh, disconnect between ourselves and some of our, our uh, uh, purchase of service uh, uh, shelter facilities, the community uh, shelter facilities, uh, if I was grabbing the right names. Um, but I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, uh, if you could speak to in the briefing note, it starts by talking to us about um, the, the, uh, the support programs that are available to individuals directly to, uh, to receive these things, both uh, uh, Found in hygiene and incontinence uh, uh, products, and yet it seems like it seems like those are things that aren't going to be available. And by the time someone is, is uh, experiencing homelessness, they may have come to us from um, having ended up uh, uh, being uh, on the street for for a time. So they're they're they've really lost the capacity to to go themselves and access the services of. An ODSP caseworker, a test caseworker, etc. So, um, I'm wondering if part of your conversation um, is is really evaluating what work is being done to assist people to get that, so that we're making emergency provisions, but we're also making sure that they have the capacity to sort this out and get themselves 
regularly supplied using the the you know the right cost shared and Ontario support programs. Uh, through the chair, councillor, uh, you know, hearing through the deputations uh, that this has been identified an issue, I think uh, you know we'll take this back and and see how we can raise awareness around those longer term supports. But most immediately in our shelters and respite centers, you know, I can let you know that those products are available and and are available on an emergency basis. The drop-in sector, which would be more of the daytime drop-ins yeah. where people aren't staying perhaps overnight, um, that's something, uh, you know, through Councillor Wong Tam's comment, we'll follow up on to determine what the need is there and, and see how we might support that need. And those were the greatest examples that, that we heard were, were the drop-in centers and you don't manage them. So you, you, you can't, you can't speak to what one person said to one person, here's your product to make it last the whole day. You don't, you don't really have the ability to control that. If that happened, you can, you can only talk to them about let's, let's properly inventory what you need. Through the chair, right. that's, that's right, uh, councillor, and, and as I say, we'll follow up with the drop-in network that oversees and works with, with drop-ins yes. across the city to determine the scope of that need. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, councillor. Um, councillor Lane. I'm just wondering, like, just, just to be perfectly clear, Gord, if, if we, you're able to get that number for us, could we get it by council or by the final budget wrap-up, just so we know, like, we want assurance that we don't need to put any more money into the budget, or if we do, we need to know how much. Yes, through the chair, uh, you know, we've looking at our own uh, directly operated system and, and the scope of need with respect to incontinence supplies. Um, we've identified it in the note, you know, $250,000, we think as an early number would be, would be a helpful um, amount to make available. We do think we can cover that within our current operating budget with, um, you know, underutilized chippy funding we get from the province um, to cover that need for this year. And we are looking uh, and introduced this year in the 2022 budget, a multi-year plan to enhance some of the funding for our nonprofit shelter providers to uh, address, if you will, in a longer term uh, approach, um, you know, some of the supports that our city operated shelters have to provide these services. Um, so to summarize, I think we, we have this covered within our 22 approach and budget, uh, but we will certainly uh, work with the drop in sector and others to, to get a better handle on the scope of this issue and need around uh, incontinence supplies. Thanks, Councillor. Any other questions? Seeing none. Okay, Steve, we'll go on to the next. Okay, uh, briefing note number 11 uh, from Social Development Finance and Administration on the operating budget uh, entitled Funding Levels and Strategic Initiatives in Social Development Finance and Administration uh, from 2015 to 2022. Questions? Counselor? Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, I'm in the middle of reading the, I, I, I jumped ahead and I'm reading um, uh, another uh, SDF&A briefing note, I'm hunting around because I think someone requested in a briefing note uh, um, uh, information on programs that would have included um, a, bit, a, a more full explanation of fair pass uh, changes this year. Am I, am I in the right briefing note right now? And I just, I opened the wrong one. I, th I think you may have opened the wrong one, Councillor. Hmm. But I'm trying to, Mr. Conforti, do you know what the councillor may be referring to? I, I'm just trying to think here. Um, so the briefing note that we're speaking to right now should be briefing note number 11 uh, within the, the package that you're looking at. If I may, Councillor Carroll, I, yes. haven't, I haven't received a request for any specific um, additions or explanations on fair pass this year i haven't received that request okay in in general questions i'll flesh that out in that in that that's case i don't have a question about either one of these sdf and okay. briefing notes thank you thank you councillor wong time your questions uh yes thank you and hi denise nice to see you um i wanted to ask you a quick question regarding the downtown east action plan uh, obviously, we started that work uh, before the, uh, the the beginning of the 2018 term. Uh, it was supposed to try to address some of the the, the the immediate health and social challenges in the downtown east. Um, 
And I know that uh, along the way it has sort of scaled up and, and, and pivoted based on the needs of the community organizations and some of the other stakeholders. Um, because we're, we're heading to the end of the downtown East action plan, which sort of wraps up in 2023, um, what are the plans for that action plan? What happens next? So uh, nice to see you, Councilor Longtime, and thank you for the question. We will be reporting back in Q2 of this year about um, progress to date, um, some of the current issues and uh, sort of a projection of what where we think the plan needs to go. And certainly we'll be having more conversations with yourself, with the um, our deputy city manager and a number of our partners as part of the projection of where we need to take the work um, after the current plan ends. Uh, thank you. And um, because, uh, and is that in anticipation of, uh, of, of changing the plan or having it sit under a, a different program, um, taking a look at the budgetary requirements in 2023 to 2029, you know, nine, if that ends up being another five-year strategy, um, what uh, can you give us a hint of, of where this plan is going to go? Uh, sure. Um, so we're not currently envisioning uh, a whole scale change um, about where the plan sits. Uh, but I certainly um, I'm actually going to invite my colleague at Aronke Ekonde, if she's on here um, to maybe step in with greater detail. But I think it's really about where we are, what the current situation and issues are and some of the strategic next steps that we see. But Adaronke, can I ask you? Thank you. Thank you so much. And through the chair, uh, uh, so uh, to the councillor, uh, certainly uh, thanks for the question in terms of the action plan. We will be reporting back on some of the initiatives that have been uh, started through that work. Um, some of the uh, collaborations that have have happened and and sort of what we see as as next steps. Uh, for the work, including, um, you know, that that setting forward the 2023 uh, work plan, so the the end of 2022 and uh, extension into 2023. That piece will give us an opportunity to assess whether there is a need for for further work. And the other piece that I will say will be a will be a part of the report back is speaking more specifically to our engagement with Indigenous communities as part of the work that we're doing. Okay, thank you, Adaronke. Um, I, I think we'll you'll find very quickly if you are not already aware that uh, the community wants us to continue that work but to scale it up. Whatever um, services or, or or levels of service that we would have anticipated in 2018 when the plan was being drafted was entirely blown out the water, um, as uh, as you know. Um, I, I have another question regarding uh, the sort of the concept of equity. Um, how large is your budget, um, uh, your operating budget compared to the City of Toronto's operating budget? What percentage do you sit at? Um, so thank you very much for um, that question, Councillor. Sorry, I'm just bringing back up that briefing note. I switched uh, my view. Um, the so right now um, in the proposed staff recommended operating budget would take us to about 1.69 percent um, of the overall city net operating budget, or 0.71 percent of the gross operating budget. So so just under two percent. One just on, about one. Let's round it up to 1.7 percent. So your division seems to be asked to do. The, the heavy lifting and policy implementation work that has everything to do with social health um, and, and even health uh, related inequities. Um, and you are sitting with just 1.7% of the city's operating budget. Um, it, it, is there something about this particular snapshot, if I could frame it that way, is like, is there something specific about your budget request compared to the amount of equity related work? Uh, that you're asked to do for the entire corporation. Um, is there something that you would like to see changed? So thank you very much for the question, uh, Councillor, and through uh, the chair. I would say that over time, um, the division has taken on an increasingly complex um, set of social development issues to, uh, to think about, to create strategies, and um, to help deliver. 
I think it's really important, and, and I actually appreciate the the this direction to to do this briefing note because I haven't looked um, at our budget um, changes over time in this level of precision. And I'm pleased to say that, as you can see, there has been an increased commitment on from council to help right size um, the division to better take on. Um, the the array of work um, that we are tasked to do. It is important for us to also say that um, SDFA is not the only one. So while you saw we're, we're leading a community safety strategy or the confronting anti-Black racism strategy and other key equity strategies, these are all corporate initiatives where other divisions are playing really important parts in, um, in the implementation. So this wouldn't be a um, the sum total of the city's commitment to equity isn't just in our budget. It's it's in all of the, the budgets of city divisions and agencies that are partaking in those corporate wide strategies. But it has been really important to us over the last few years for um, council to invest in the ways that it has um, because the staff over time have been stretched beyond our capacity and moving into things like really good monitoring evaluation and outcomes work takes time and resources and expertise and so adding those within our budget has also been an important um, development over the last few years the sector can always use more resources and so could we but i think we're in a much stronger place than i would say even two or three years ago okay, denise thank, thank you, you. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you because I, I do recognize that you folks are carrying the lion's share. As generous as you are to all the other divisions, you are carrying the lion's share of, uh, of equity related work at the city. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Councillor. Any other questions? Denise, just wanted to, uh, I just have a few questions myself and just on, on top of uh, Councillor Long Term. So just, I um, mean, you mentioned the, um, the, the, the sort of the net uh, levy. Um, with regard to the SDFA is 1.69. Can you just talk about it? Where, and, and the, the briefing note I think I requested really looks at over the last uh, eight years. So can you just talk about, because and, and I'm looking at the note here, 2015, it was 0.81%. We are now at 1.6. So we're more than double our investments. Um, and when you look at the net, um, you, you know, way more than doubled, you know, in SD, SDFA, and you have grown considerably. But can you just talk about, I mean, over the last eight years, I mean, how we have grown, how we have focused on increasing our investments that, and, and, and I think it was mentioned, we could always, I think you mentioned you could always use more, but we have been really, as a council, um, invested in, in continuing to grow SDFA. I just want you to comment on that. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Crawford. Um, and again, my appreciation for um, asking us to do this note. So as the note points out, um, we have uh, our budget from 2015 to 20, uh, 2022 has increased by 43.3 million gross and 47.6 million net. Um, and so that's quite significant. Um, you heard uh, through um, the informal parts of the budget that I continued to share um, an important message, which was we've taken pride um, as a division in stretching every dollar that we've had to, uh, to meet council expectations and the expectations of community, um, and, but we needed more. And so I'm really pleased that in the staff recommended budget, there has been some important enhancements in some key areas to help us um, achieve uh, closer to what I think council and community expectations are. Uh, we are getting better, like the division is becoming right sized. Uh, and I think that that's absolutely critical because without that, we can't deliver on the mandate that council continues to give us. And we can't meet the expectations of community to invest in them to be adequate partners. So I would say that in the eight years, there has been significant growth um, in the resource level that has been given. And as you know, Councillor Crawford, um, the needs are high and deep. Uh, and so there's the, all there's more always to be done, but, but it is a much stronger division um, as a result of the investments over the last number of years. So what you're saying is, um... We're listening and we're continuing to invest as needed and we'll do more. I appreciate that. And yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, Councillor Crawford. Okay, thanks. 
Um, seeing no other, oh, Councilor Layton, sorry. Sorry, if I could just, I'm, there, there's no amounts in table two. And I'm wondering the fair pass transit discount program, does, it, what does that represent as in, in table one? How, like what's the value of that within SDFA's budget for the cost? So the current um, cost of fair pass in the two rounds that we have is 10.3 million. So the current, and when were the two rounds put in? Um, I think this uh, started in uh, the funding begun in 2018, I believe. Okay. And it doesn't include the youth component of uh, that sort of fair transit, free transit. It, it, that, that, that's not included in the SDF. No, budget, it's correct? not. No. Okay. This, we don't administer that. That's a direct TCC administered piece. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Nanziata. I just did, uh, sorry, I didn't ask a question earlier. So Denise, thank you very much for everything that you do. And also to what you have done um, is in the past couple of years, you've had, um, there's a lot more partnership with community groups on, um, you know, in, in, in funding some of these community groups that are providing some of the services as well, um, which I believe has been very, very successful as well, correct? Absolutely. I think one of the things that's in SDFA's DNA is a core partnership with the community-based um, sector and with residents groups, and we've been building that capacity over time. And certainly in the pandemic, um, we have, uh, through our TO Supports Investment Fund, used um, provincial funds, I think, largely to invest quite a significant amount um, into the community-based sector to ensure that they have some um, capacity to support vulnerable people within the city. And we continue to try to ensure that their needs are heard by our overall system, um, especially in the current uh, wave of the pandemic that we find ourselves. Okay, I just wanna make that point because I know that, you know, some of the community groups in my ward, they've been working with and it's, they've been very successful in expanding the program and expanding the funding. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. And I would say that as we look to recovery, one of those things that we're going to need to collectively continue to pay attention to is how the sector is doing and anything else that the city can do to better support them. Thank you. Okay, I think we're done with the questions on this one, Steve. Okay. Um, so moving forward, we have two briefing notes that have come from the Infrastructure and Development Services area. Uh, briefing note number 10 uh, from the Transit Expansion Office uh, entitled Funding for the Eglinton East Light Rail Transit. Questions? I think, no, I think we're good. Okay, and the second briefing note is from Transportation Services uh, entitled 2022 Investments in Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. We're looking. Oh, sorry, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, so we'll start with Councillor Wong Tam outside Councillor first. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, um, can you give us a sense of uh, whether or not we are on track with our Vision uh, Zero uh, spending as well as service rollout implementation? How are we faring? Morning, Councillor Wong Tam, and through the chair, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are very busily implementing Vision Zero. I was um, happy to see the table that is in this briefing note. I think it pulls together year over year uh, the amount of work that's been done to continue to retrofit our uh, infrastructure to focus on safety. Um, all of the implementation that we've done uh, is really based on the knowledge of what works to help support pedestrian cycling safety. Um, and so uh, many, many of those pieces are in our budget. We continue to implement them and um, and we are making great progress. So it's, it's always challenging to say, you know, that we're exactly on the right path. I think we are on the best path. 
uh, the numbers are demonstrating in terms of reduction that we are on, you know, the trend is moving in the right direction. Uh, but we know from looking at other cities around the world that um, that there are often uh, changes that happen there, but we will continue to work down this path. So I would say, yes, we're on the right path. We're investing in the right aspects um, and we'll continue to listen to what we hear from you all and from the community as we move forward. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, with respect to the, the five year vision, uh, so the, the uh, vision zero strategy um, began spending and uh, implementation 2017. I think it was supposed to ramp up and be somewhat completed by 2021. Uh, we're looking at um, outstanding work that hasn't been done, perhaps carry forward. Um, how, what's the intention? Is it to sort of Fill fill the gaps of everything has that has been done in 2022, and then and then be able to say that we've concluded our five year um, strategy. Um, where where are we going with the timeline here? So through the chair, it's definitely a long term strategy, and uh, like we do with many other programs, where we uh, define a, a longer term strategy and then the implementation that we're going to do over the shorter term uh, to sort of align with uh, the funding, etc. Um, so we we will continue on uh, because we we know that there's still going to continue to be a need, um, and. Uh, I was going to ask, I was going to put in 1 other thing there, but I'll, it'll come to me if you have another question for me. Um, I, I guess the question I, I was hoping to, to maybe get an answer for is um, our 5, our 5 year plan is starting to look like it's stretched into a 6 year plan. Um, do you anticipate that it will even take longer to to roll out the original vision of vision 0? I, I actually think it will be an ongoing way that we do business. And I mean, I think one of the big focuses when we put the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan together is that it really should transform the way that transportation delivers our service, because we really need to be focused on delivering a service around safety and accessibility, um, and especially focused on our most vulnerable road users. So um, we have uh, taken a long turn at, at transforming the way we deliver service. And I think part of the, you know, the capital investment that is still uh, lagging behind is, is impacted by a number of things. It's impacted by, you know, supply chain issues like the rest of the world and many other sectors, but it's also uh, impacted by our need to coordinate the work that we do in the right of way. A number of these pieces are small intersection improvements or, or uh, one off improvements that get wrapped into broader coordinated works. And as you know, we try to minimize the overall impact on the traveling public when we do those types of improvements. So trying to do a sort of a full court press strategy to get it done, but I do think it's going to be ongoing. Okay, thank you. And I guess because it's going to be ongoing, is it worthwhile for your division to put out a refresher for us? So maybe Vision Zero 2.0 or 3.0 at this point in time, uh, just simply because we're still looking at a, a rollout from uh, 2017 to 2021, and I think it's starting to. It, it looks a little confusing to me. Um, and I would. It, it, I think it, there may be some advantages saying. This is what it's going to look like from 2022 to perhaps the next five year out. So uh, we have we did a 2.0 Vision Zero update plan in 2019, and I we know. would plan uh, to do another one. I think we're we're thinking that we'd probably be um, on a you know two to three year basis. So we will will be coming forward with another one. I, I don't know if it will, maybe in 2023 is the right timing. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I think Councilor McKelvey's next, and then Carol. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for the, the budget note, which is very helpful. So I just want to confirm amount. So this year's proposal is 64 million for vision zero, and that's not including the 20 million for bike lanes, correct? That is correct. Through the chair, that's correct, Councillor McKelvey. Okay, and then on the breakdown of work, um, where are the the main new enhancements. So there's automated speed enforcement what, and school crossing guards. Are those the two main enhancements this year? Uh, yes. Okay. And in terms of the number of intersections, um, are you able, those have been, I know they've been slow to roll out speed camera, uh, sorry, um, uh, stoplights. Um, is that, you know, how many are proposed this year and are we kind of on track to start delivering on that? Um, I don't know if Roger Brown is on the call. Uh, I believe that he might be, but um, we have actually have, uh, we are on track to deliver 
uh, our intersection, especially the the signals. We have 35 proposed in 2022. Um, again, as I mentioned to Councilor Wong Tam, sort of reframing the way that we deliver our service is just as important in Vision Zero. And uh, we've made we've done a, a, a quite a deep dive into how we deliver traffic signals and trying to uh, really uh, limit the time frame that it takes from when Councilor directs Council directs us to do that to um, to when we get them in the ground. So uh, we're we are uh, on track to get those done. Yes. Okay. Great. And is that I know on the website you have like a, a tracker um what are the ones that are school zones are on there are are the crossing lights on there as well yes all of our vision zero improvements are on that uh tracker on the vision zero road safety map okay. i think it had been experiencing some technical challenges a couple of weeks ago but i believe i just heard that it's back up and running again it's all fixed okay great okay thank you thank you thank you councillor carroll uh, yes, I, I'm going to need some help and I apologize because we, we probably went through this the last time we brought an update and, uh, and it's all escaped my mind. Um, speed limit reductions. I don't really understand what we're saying about speed limit reductions in this table that looks at, uh, you know, the, the, the five years from 2017 to end of 2021. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Carroll, I'm going to ask Jacqueline Hayward to um, to answer that question because she's a little bit closer to that than I am. Sure. Hi, Councillor. Through the chair, Hi. we have done uh, a significant number of citywide speed limit reductions. So the focus first, as per the Vision Zero 2.0 strategy, was the major roads, including arterials mm -hmm. and major collectors, and so that has been completed citywide. Uh, reductions and there may be some one off reductions that we work with councillors on. We're now focused um, as of 2021 and beyond on the local speed redu reductions in in, per, in a zone basis. So we've been taking a series of reports to community council to have those approved and then implemented. And we'll continue to do that over the next few years. Right. But so you really have mapped out a plan to do it to do it citywide. Um, and that the question is, you know, a, a counselor <clears throat> may not like where they are in the plan, but but there is a plan that looks at a vision zero approach to speed limits that that will be on by the end of this on every street. Am I right? That's correct. We are making it consistent with what council had previously approved for the local speed re limit reductions to 30 in Toronto East York and and pushing that out citywide on a community by community basis and the. The locations that are being delivered first are data driven based on the locations within that community that have had more collisions and, and injuries and as a result. Right. Um, and I guess you could call this vision zero having the desired effect. Um, I have a lot of neighborhoods where they don't have a huge collision record. They have, you know, big isolated incidents and they're very painful and tragic, but they, they don't have the record that prioritizes them. So they're they're towards the end of the plan. The problem is vision zero is making people very aware of um, how impactful it is if they've, if they've driven through the neighborhoods where it's fully implemented. So now we are inundated with requests. Can we have traffic coming here? Can we have a speed limit change there? And and I, I see staff um, really overwhelmed with the requests. My question is, do, do changes like that do those slow down the Vision Zero implementation uh, or, or is the budget resource such that Vision Zero is just going to stay on its track and keep its timing? Or do these one ups begin to sap resources from Vision Zero implementation? It, they can do. That's a great count point, Councillor, because we are trying to stay focused on data driven. And that's not just based on one off uh, situations, but based on the safety trends for a community. Um, and the best way to see those numbers of people being killed and seriously injured on our roads coming down is to focus on where the trends of, of those collisions are taking place. Primarily those arterial roads, but also continuing to make local communities and local roads safer um, through this really concerted intentional effect that's strategic. Right. So, you know, where possible with an isolated accident or, or an isolated problem and we've got to we've got to deal with it, you can. But if someone brought forward a big change and said, I want this for my area right now, they're basically subverting the Vision Zero schedule. 
Yes, we, we are uh, okay. working from the Vision Zero 2.0 council directed strategy of how we deliver. And that's one that is a, based on a data driven approach. Okay, that helps me. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Seeing no other questions, I think we're on to the. Oh, sorry, Councillor Layton. If I could, just really quickly. So, the mayor of New York City announced a great fanfare, um, some interventions at intersections because they're, uh, they're a place where accidents tend to happen. Um, could you highlight which of those? They, they announced they would be doing a thousand um, in no particular time frame. Um, but could could you outline which of these deliverables, which of what they outlined they would be doing, actually already exists in in in, um, in Vision Zero, and what doesn't, and maybe why? Thanks for the question, Councillor. The thousand intersections is certainly um, great, and New York has a, a great program for a large city. We are undertaking the same kinds of um, of deliverables. About a, a few hundred of the a thousand intersections identified in New York were accessible pedestrian signals, and others were pedestrian head start signals. We are um, well on our way to uh, make our signals accessible and have pedestrian head starts. We currently have. Um, almost 800 pedestrian head start signals across the city and we're continuing to roll those out in a few hundred per year. Um, it also included raised intersections and crosswalks. And while we don't have hundreds of them throughout the city, we have a few dozen and we are planning 12 more in 22 and putting several more in our capital program in upcoming years as well. Um, so raised intersections and crosswalks exist in the city now and will continue to be built. Would they be covered under geometric safety improvements? No, so in the chart that's in this briefing note, we have about 60 um, geometric safety improvements. Those are specifically data driven locations of geometric changes. Those um, in addition to those specific data driven geometric changes, we have geometric changes coming as part of cycle lane development as well as and I'm being done as part of cycle lane development as well as coming on the raised intersections and crosswalks. Those are in addition to the numbers you see on this chart. In addition to and how many are we doing this year? I, several are in ward, ward 11, so I, I, I know I have a handful. Are, where else? We expect about 12 new race intersections or crosswalks across the city in 22, some of which are on Port Union and Scarborough, um, and others are on, on Bloor Street, as you mentioned, um, sorry, on College Street um, and other locations in the city. Okay, so to compare us and the last three years of Vision Zero, last four years of Vision Zero, and what? New York is undertaking is we're, we're actually quite far along in okay. to undertake the same things that they are doing now. I would say we're probably pretty comparable. As I said, New York is a much larger city than us. So on a size of city basis the, and the types of initiatives, I think we're, we're fairly close. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, Steve, I think we're good for the next one. Okay, great. Um, so moving on, we now have uh, two briefing notes coming from the Finance and Treasury Services. Uh, the first is briefing note number eight from the Office of the CFO and Treasurer. Uh, it's a capital briefing note entitled Lakeshore Arena Corporation Status Update on Loan. Questions? Yes, I, I have a question. Oh, sorry, Council, go ahead. Great, thank you. So I'm having trouble with my camera. The um, just on that, Mr. Conforti, what is the uh, current amount, and when did that? It was a loan, or was it a loan guarantee? Which one? Uh, thanks for the chair. I'll uh, I'll refer to um, our our controller Andrew or uh, or Heather uh, to to address that question. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, through the chair to uh, Councillor Fletcher, uh, those are uh, these are in fact loans. Uh, they're uh, historical loans, generally speaking, related to the the um, the, re the rebuild of the arena quite a number of years ago. So these are are not have not been newly advanced. They're being um, repaid. Just tell me a little bit more about those loans, please. Uh, 
was this a city owned facility or was it the Lakeshore Lions that bought this? So you're, you're, you're correct. It was the Lakeshore Lions. It is a, who owned it. It is a separate. It is a separate corporation of the city uh, at this point in time. It's it's managed by a separate board. Uh, right. And the loans, both with the city and with Infrastructure Ontario, were generally speaking, there's about thirty million dollars uh, of them. I, I'm, thank you. I, I'm going to get there in a minute. I'm just yeah. going back to the fact that it was owned by the Lakeshore Lions. Yes. And they were going to default and the arena was probably going to have to close as i remember what year was that andrew please uh, i'd have to get back to councillor fletcher on that it was quite a number of years ago though i think it was under mayor miller perhaps you 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 may you may you are probably okay correct. thank you so just to recap it was an arena that served etobicoke that was going to have to close because the Lakeshore Alliance could no longer carry it. And it was considered a very important piece of infrastructure for the sports community. And the city uh, moved to assist with a direct loan. And how much was that for city loan? So, um, just looking at the, at the note and, and it was around 25 to 30 million dollars at the time 25 to 30 million at the time what could that be worth in today's dollars quite a bit more i would think if it was 2010 you can figure that one out for council but certainly um, we we can and and howie howie dayton the the uh, chair of the, the board is also on so howie by all means if that, if, if he knows yes, the answer yes, that's great if not i only have a certain amount of time thank yes. you uh, so that's 25, but how much was the IO loan? Uh, the history is that about 20 million of the, the 30 is, is the ILO, IO loans. Okay. So the IO, so that would be, let's say 10 million direct city loan dollars. Am I correct? It approximately is about 4 million currently of the city, city loan. But it was 10 million to start if it was 20 million from IO. That was 30 million. So yeah. we turned over 10 million. And this it was to save that. And why wasn't that a loan guarantee? Why was that simply dollars then, please? I I can't answer that, Councillor. Okay. I'll have um, the You can do your research for council on that one. I, Thank I, you, I, Andrew. Yeah. And how much is in the current, what I'll call the reserve, or how much does the city have available for loans? of this nature currently and for loan guarantees. There's a there's a loan guarantee bucket that I think has about $140 million in it that is only used if it's a loan guarantee or it's uh, notional really. It's not real dollars, they're just guaranteed, correct? Um, uh, I, I can't answer that. I'm not sure if Steve has is aware of the, the total amount. Do you have an idea, Steve? What's in there? The um, website says 140. So uh, I'm sure I'm being being a money person. You you know it has to be accurate if it's posted publicly. Yeah, and through the chair, we'll we'll uh, review that and confirm it. Have it available for final wrap up. Thank you very much. So just to recap, that Lake and, and they're paying that back over time, and it's now a city facility, correct? It, it is now it is now a corporation that uh, has a separate board of which the city is uh, uh, city members are on the board as well but we don't own it it's not it's not owned directly by the city it's now. not owned so it's not owned directly by the city 30 million dollar loan 10 million dollars of which was direct city dollars and we don't own it should it collapse or should something happen does the city have the right to take that arena back? Your last question. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I would have, we will have to. Back to yeah, you. through the chair, if I could, uh, through the chair to the councillor Fletcher, we'll, we'll, we'll get back and confirm the, the ownership and, and sort of the, uh, that scenario, if it becomes, uh, you know, the uh, default scenario, the default yeah. scenario. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thanks councillor. Um, okay, Steve, I think we're, oh. Yeah, no, we're good. Uh, we're doing uh, next one. Okay, great. Um, 
So briefing note 13, uh, so this is a briefing note uh, from the financial planning division, uh, both related to operating and the capital budget. Uh, and it's a comparison of the housing related budgets, both operating and capital from 2015 compared to what's in the 2022 recommended budgets. Thank you, I think I saw Councillor Lai's hand, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to confirm, a few, I have a few questions. Just wanted to confirm that uh, how much the city spent in the operating cost uh, in 2015 versus how much is proposed to be spent in this year's proposed budget? Through the chair, Councillor, I can start and, and I think Abby might be on uh, this call as well and I can ask her to jump in. But as you can see in the briefing note, um, the city is on table one in this proposed budget. In total, the city is spending and investing just over 1. Uh, 1.04 billion compared to in 2015, where there was an investment of 665 million. Okay, so when you also add the COVID-19 spending to the operation cost, what is the difference from 2015 uh, to today? So through you, Mr. Chair, so the difference prior to COVID, there is a $378 million difference. When you add on the COVID, the additional COVID pressure, which is 315 million, if you add them both, um, we are just, just shy of 700 million, 693 million, which is, um, as you can see from 2015, it's it's almost it's just over double what we invested in 2015. So the percentage would be double, meaning 100 percent. Oh, just over 100 percent, correct? Okay. When you include COVID, yes. All right. So um, when excluding the COVID-19 uh, cost, it looks like the city share of the housing in terms of operating budget has also increased from 54% to 60%. Am I correct? That is correct. Yeah, so is it fair to say that the city has been a lot more and has spent a lot more and has been taking more on the responsibility from the other two levels of government? You think it's fair to say that? Yes, as you can see in table two, the provincial portion has stayed relatively the same. There's been a slight drop and within the federal funding, there's been a significant drop um, from just looking at it. So they had a total percentage of 24% in 2015 to 18% today. Yeah, just on another question, how do you determine the outcome? Uh, for instance, uh, for example, how many homeless were there in 2016 and how many are there today? So how do you measure success on this? So thank you through the chair. I'm going to ask Abby, um, who is directly involved with that data that would probably be able to give you more insight than I could. Uh, and thank you, Heather, through the through the chair. We have um, a number of different outcomes. I'm going to let my colleague go speak to specifically the number of homeless, but the housing TO plan, which sets our outcomes for the next 10 years, has clear outcomes in relation to the number of new homes we want to produce, so 18,000 supportive homes and 40,000 affordable homes. Uh, so all of this additional money that the city is spending on both operating and capital helps us achieve uh, those outcomes that we clearly lay out and we do an annual update every year. Uh, but I don't know, Gord, if you want to jump in on specifically the homeless numbers. Uh, sure, thanks, Abby, and through the chair, uh, Councillor Lai. So, you know, if you look at 2015 and the number of shelter beds the city was operating, uh, we had about 4,500. Uh, last night in the city, we sheltered uh, 7,700 people. So there's been, uh, you know, a significant increase in the amount of service we're providing to people experiencing homelessness. Um, and and I think now through uh, our work with uh, Abby and the 10-year housing plan, the focus really is on on getting these folks experiencing homelessness and and the increase in shelter um, use over and getting folks into the supportive housing they need to be successful over the long term. Yeah, just but how do you uh, uh, how do you help people that come out of those supportive housing? Is there a strategy for that one? 
Uh, there is. So, you know, each person that comes into the shelter system um, is to meet with a housing counselor and develop a, a housing plan um, that will support them in finding permanent housing. I think the period between 2015 and, and today uh, has shown, of course, a dramatic increase in, in the cost of housing in the city of Toronto. And certainly there are additional barriers with respect to, you know, some of the needs of, of the people experiencing homelessness too, related to their health or mental health. But again, that's where working very closely with Abby's team and some of the new supportive housing projects, we're looking to move some folks into those supportive housing projects so that they can be successful over the long term. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just have one last question, if may have, I may have your indulgence. On the capital side, it looks like the city is currently providing over 50, uh, 70% on the 10-year uh, capital plan. Are there any outstanding asks to the provincial or the federal government for more funds for their capital investment in housing? That's my last question. Um, through the chat, oh, go ahead. Steven. Sure. So maybe I'll start and then I can I can turn it over to Abby through the chair. So just to note that uh, the 2022 capital program actually includes an added 640 million in investments uh, directly towards achieving our 10,000 units of affordable housing. Um, and this this helps us move towards the goal of 40,000 units to create the remaining 20,000 new affordable homes. We will require investments from the federal and provincial government. And uh, I'll turn to Abby to elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, that's correct. And the short answer is um, we provided information in, in the larger budget note about how much money we need from the federal and provincial governments on the capital and operating side to complete all of the actions in the 10 year plan. Uh, the city is leading its investment right now at about 7.1 billion. And we have an outstanding amount from the other levels of government um, of, of around um, uh, $13 billion in terms of all of the, the casting for all of the actions that we need to take to deliver comprehensively on that 10 year plan. So we work very closely with the other levels of government and um, let them know what we have kind of funding coming up in the next year, which projects we want their focused attention to to fund. Um, and so um, we're trying to get their attention and get their commitments to housing now projects, for example, um, and also leveraging the money that's coming from the provincial government in terms of investment in renewal projects as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ronka. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, through you to staff, um, when the SSHA um, expenditures are itemized here or just uh, uh, listed, um, does this include both shelter and I guess a smaller portion of the portfolio division is, is housing related. Does it include both? Is, are you speaking about shelter, respite drop-ins and, um, uh, and, and housing? Is that what that line represents? That's your, your full budget? Through the chair, councillor, that's correct. And so I guess um, because the, the budget notice is asking for, I think, housing specific and housing related expenditures, um, are you, um, is there a way to break down that line item so it actually speaks more accurately to, to what is very directly housing specific? So removing the, the, the shelter expenditures aside, I'm just curious to know about uh, the housing expenditures. Through the uh, chair, Councillor, we, we, could, we could do that for you. Um, I think that would be helpful. I, I recognize that you have an, a number of programs that are that are run that are housing related, such as Rent Bank and, and Epic. But I'm just curious to know actual dollars for housing. And uh, it, so, is are you? Do I need to move a motion or get someone to move a motion for me for, to to get that information uh, as a as a perhaps a few further briefing note? Um, through the chair, I think we can provide that in our in our wrap up to to committee and council for you. Okay, fantastic. Um, and if you do that, um, will that also mean that you'll have to sort of um, reassess the budget note that's before us here, or or somehow make some modifications so it, it reads a little bit more housing housing specific and related, and then shelter in another um, uh, column. Uh, through the chair, I think that's exactly what we'll do is amend that budget note to further break that out okay. um, and, and recirculate. Okay, thank you. Um, 
there was one chart, sorry, I lost my place here. There was one chart that signified that the province was, you know, maintaining its funding level and somehow the, the you know, the, the delinquent partner might be the federal government, which is not really the narrative that's out there. Can you explain um, what that, uh, how you came to that conclusion? Because we've always heard that it was the province that was sort of not paying its dues. Uh, through the chair, I, I can start. So you're referring to table two in the diagram. So table two specifically looks at uh, revenues within the operating budget uh, in support of our housing secretariat program, SSHA program, and our TCHC subsidy. So when we look at the, the cost shared uh, on the revenue side specific to the operating costs, that's where we see that uh, the contribution from the province back in 2015 had been 22.3% or about $148 million. Uh, it has gone up to 229.5 million, but it's still stating static, uh, roughly at 22%. Um, in terms of uh, overall funding, I think we would also have to look at the capital side of the tables that are provided. So when you're looking at table four, table four provides the funding share between the city, the province, and the federal government on our capital investments. And I believe you're referencing the investment there, which is sitting at 3.6 million or just 0.1% on the capital side of the initiative. That's correct. Thank you for, for that. I lost the place on my, on, my, uh, on my screen. So I guess because the bulk of the money that we're seeing from the federal government and provincial government in these cases are going to SSHA um, and it may not be going directly to, to housing. Um, if we were to, again, extrapolate those numbers so we remove the shelter component and strictly looked at, you know, what is money coming in from the other orders of government specifically for housing, we'll probably get a very different table. Um, and so I guess to Abby, because you answered my, my earlier question, is, um, is that also going to be revisited when you, when you come up with a refresh note for us? Uh, through the chair, yeah, we can take another look at that. I mean, the majority of funding from the federal government in uh, the recent years has been on the capital side. Obviously, we've received significant investment on the rapid housing initiative. Uh, so the increases, they have increases they have increased their flow of funding, um, but the city has also increased its um, capital um, goals for housing as well. Um, so that also may explain some of the percentages that you see. Okay, thank you. And then my final question is back to table two, um, because this chart I believe is only, is primarily looking at um, as offering expense, or does it also include capital? So through the chair, table two is specific to operating expenses. Only operating. Okay, so thank you. And then the subsequent table is really the piece that's housing, uh, housing TO related, um, and that's what um, uh, that's sort of the, uh, the 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 overall messaging that we've been receiving is that the federal government has come up with a modest amount, provincial government really falling far behind, um, and uh, and that's the that's the real snapshot. Would that be a fair assessment? Um, so, if you're referring to table four, yes. Yeah, so, table four is a reflection of the the investments that are being made in our capital programs. Uh, and, correct. And thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Seeing none, let's go on to the next briefing though. Over to you, Steve. Sure, thank you. Um, so, and uh, the last of the briefing notes that were submitted new for today uh, is from both the city manager's office and finance and treasury services. It's briefing note number 18 uh, uh, related to uh, the continued COVID-19 support funding from federal and provincial governments and potential impacts of inadequate 2022 funding support. Thanks. I have a, I'll start with a few questions myself, if we can. Um, so this really is a briefing note uh, talking about the $1.4 billion of relief funding we need. Um, and we have a contingency plan. So you can talk about what the contingency plan is. Um, you know, if we don't get the money, we're going to have to cut back on capital plans, state of good repair, stuff like that. So thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. So the, the contingency plan is comprised of a couple of different elements. It is money that we have put aside for COVID relief. So that's sitting in reserves, but there's also a portion that is sitting in our current operating budget, which is 300 million, um, which is our contribution from current to capital. So the combination of those two 
components is actually what will eventually fund capital programs. So the money that is sitting in reserves is money that would have otherwise been directed towards capital programs. CFC is obviously something that funds our capital program in the current year. So to answer your question specifically, it 300 million from CFC directly impacts state of good repair funding in 2022. Hey, um, now I just want to talk a bit about the federal provincial uh, governments. They, they have the ability to run deficits and debt and all that. We don't, we have to balance our uh, uh, budgets every year. So again, talk about the pandemic financing and how it can potentially impact the city of Toronto. Again, going back to if we don't get this money. Sure. Um, so it is legislatively required that we have a balanced budget. Um, that balanced budget in instance, in this case, as well as last year uh, was, was able to be delivered because we had a backstop. So we don't have the ability to finance operating activities, operating deficits. We're not oh, I think you're allowed froze there. to fund operating deficits. Sorry. I think you're froze there for a second. You're okay now. Okay, apologies. Um, if we were able to fund operating deficits, we don't have the revenue tools that would be able to finance them. Um, so the legislative requirements of a balanced budget and not being able to fund. To finance. Yeah, I think you're cutting out of it. Heather, I'm just wondering if you maybe turn off your video, just to, the rest of the question, just to make it a little easier. Sorry. Um, so we don't get the, if we don't get this, I mean, the, the other two governments have been very, um, supportive over the last couple of years. So I just want to be clear on that. And, and we're hoping that they'll be as supportive. But in the event that this part of the um, federal money, provincial money doesn't come in, what will our budget look like for this year coming year? So, the and again, I need to come back to the fact that we were required to deliver a balanced budget. And we were able to put in the request and the ask of other orders of government to help with the COVID pressures. Um, in the event that we did not have that, we would have had to come with a budget that introduced new revenues or decrease in expenses or a combination of both. The one, t the, the backstop that we have is a one time solution. And I have to emphasize the fact that we all know that COVID is not going to disappear like a flick of a switch. And the concern we have is we need this backstop for out years as well. And so the, the hope is, is that we will continue to be able to hold it as a backstop without impacting programs, service levels, service cuts, et cetera, and to avoid significant tax increases. A 1% tax increase is th approximately 35 million. And if you just did the quick math, 1.4 billion supported only by a tax increase would be a 40% tax increase. So again, and just extrapolating, um, we have this year, but we don't get the, um, if you have to use that backstop, you're just as worried or probably more worried for next year's budget, of course. Yes, if, if you think back to the budget launch, we did do a projection of where we thought we would be in 2023, and we had a range, a COVID range of com continuing impacts, primarily driven, obviously, by transit. Um, but our, our range is about 500 to one, just over 1 billion. So again, oh. the backstop is going to be needed for future years as well, and even beyond 2023. Okay, last question quickly. Can you just talk to me a bit about the tax stabilization reserve? In, in the past, we've used the tax stabilization re reserve as an offset uh, for adding or increasing the uh, the budget. Can you tell me uh, where, a bit about where the tax stabilization reserve is, um, what the impact of the cap capital program could be if we, we start uh, dipping into that as part of the, uh, the budget? So, thank you. The tax stabilization account um, is as of right now, uh, our COVID backstop account. It is monies that have come from 
Uh, if you recall back into 2021, when we had MLTT over performance, we asked council's permission to put that into our tax stabilization reserve. That would have otherwise gone to fund capital projects. Um, when we have underspending pre-COVID days, that surplus went into our capital finance plan. So when you look at our backstop, it doesn't matter how you look at it, it otherwise would be funding our capital plan. So any any need or any request to draw from the tax stabilization reserve impacts our backstop and eventually will impact our capital plan. Okay, thank you. The questions uh, was, okay, got a bunch here. Why don't we start? Uh, sorry, I should have gone to outside councillors first. I apologize that. So let's start with uh, Councillor Wong Tam, then we'll go to Nunzi Adam and Nathan. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No need to apologize. I, I appreciate the indulgence. Uh, you, you've let us in at diverse different times and we've popped onto your screen. Um, I want to ask a question regarding the $1.4 billion. The request is, of course, to the provincial and federal government. Um, how do you, um, is there a specific uh, breakup of that quantum to each order of government? How are you making that request? So through you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Councillor. Um, so if I can just share with you our experience over the last two years, uh, in 2020, the advocacy, advocacy was done with both the province as well as the federal government. The federal government, in actual fact, uh, initiated the safe restart funding by flowing monies to the province for the province to then distribute. In 2021, the experience was very different. The province is actually the one that took the lead in providing safe restart funding. So for the current year, we are advocating to both and we haven't, we haven't specifically given a proportionate share. Uh, we are just making sure that there's an appreciation and a realization for the impacts um, that COVID is having on the city's ability to continue to deliver on COVID COVID, um, COVID responses, as well as the pressures that COVID is in actual fact creating. Okay, thank you. And uh, just historically, how have those uh, funds been flowing from the provincial and federal government? Do you recall what the quantum is uh, for 2020 between the, the province and the feds, and then what it was in 2021? I don't have it in front of me, um, but I can say that in 2020, the federal government uh, was the primary funder of the total that we received. We've received 2.8 billion in total since 2020, um, but in 2021, the primary amount that we received was from the province. Okay, thank you. And um, and so you cited that uh, if if and, and, and it's unlikely that they won't come through the provincial and federal government. Uh, if we do have to find ways to backstop that uh, $1.4 billion pressure, you've cited a number of programs that are capital related uh, that would have to be deferred. Have you put together that list of what some of those programs would, would have to, that, that have to be deferred? And how do you determine which one do you cancel? Which one do you defer out? So the work is underway now. Um, as, as I want to highlight, this is a contingency plan. Um, so we are going through an exercise now of looking at what gets funded from the capital from current contribution. That amount, as I mentioned, is, a th is 300 million of that 1.4 billion backstop. So we're going through a prioritization exercise right now as to what that capital from current actually funds, looking for opportunities um, to prioritize within the state of good repair to ensure that anything that is legislatively required or a health and safety issue remain priorities for us to spend. But that work is currently underway. Okay, thank you. And when can we see that, um, uh, that work? Well, as I mentioned, that work is underway. Um, we, we very likely would have it um, I would hope by executive committee, definitely by council. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the reason I ask is as uh, as the the pandemic um, uh, sort of restrictions as well as this, the federal and provincial response change, we know that there are a number of programs that they've put out there to support communities, whether it's tenants or perhaps business owners. They're starting to take their 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 feet off the the pedal. 
Um, and, uh, and I think the concern is that while they ease up on, on those type of financial supports, they may be also easing up on, on other supports, uh, including the supports that we need as a, as a city. Um, and I guess my, my final question is, um, are, are any of those um, uh, potential deferred programs for capital improvements, are they, are, would any of them be already underway or at least in the development stage where consultation has been completed, tender has been drawn, but you're nervous about releasing it out until you know, um, you know what what else might be coming uh, from the provincial and federal government. So thank you for the question, through you, Mr. Chair, um, Councillor. The the process that we have with regards to our capital plan, there are multi-year programs and projects um, that wouldn't be impacted necessarily by this. Uh, what we would be looking at is the state of good repair, where uh, once the budget is approved in a typical year. Staff would then be starting a, starting a tendering process uh, and would be looking at our construction months. Those are very likely um, the, the projects that are going to be impacted through this process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nunziata, I think you had your hand up and. Yes, yeah, so or... looking at uh, the chart, so three, 300 million would be cancellation of planned capital projects, and the rest will be on um, uh, state of good repair, correct? So the 300 capital project, 300 million um, that I referred to and that you're referring to in the chart, in actual fact, does fund state of good repair. Okay. So now I know I asked a question uh, a week ago um, to the city manager. So I, I know that you're in discussions with the uh, province and the federal federal government. Now, where are you with the discussion? Like, I, it sounded to me um, that we were getting very close. Um, so where are we now? And what is the deadline for it? So through you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Councillor. Um, there are ongoing conversations, uh, Councillor. Um, we speak not necessarily on a daily basis, but there are there are constant conversations. Um, with regards to the deadline, as I just mentioned, that when, once the budget is approved, that is typically when capital projects start moving forward. Uh, the tenders are prepared, they go out to the market, et cetera. If we don't have a commitment by the time the budget is approved, those projects that would have normally gone in and, init and been initiated in a tendering process are on, on, are on pause. If we miss the summer construction months, they will be canceled. So what if what if they tell us the province of feds that you are getting the money, but it's going to be delayed a little longer? Do you, then do you still cancel those projects? Like if if they've made a commitment that we're getting the money, but we have you know it's going to be delayed a little longer. For you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, actually, if we were to receive a commitment in writing that would allow us to continue and, and proceed as we would planned, as we have planned. If the commitment is the key, the cash flowing of it is not yeah. over. It's just having the commitment to the know commitment. that during our fiscal year, we will right. be we will be kept whole. Okay. So is the messaging to the province and the feds that if we don't receive this funding, uh, the, you know, this will be the impact? They understand? We we have we have had very detailed conversations about our reserves, about the capital plan, about the impacts on our projects, the economic impact, et cetera. So yes, they they fully understand and the timing need. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Yes, I'm just wondering that if we can put this briefing note in the context of what is going on for the other governments. As you go to ask for this. Um, uh, you know, uh, Omicron related continuance of support. We're, we're also in receipt of an economic report. Douglas Porter uh, was at our very last economic development to tell us that uh, one thing to keep in mind that there are winners and losers in the pandemic and that Ontario has surprisingly unprecedented uh, um, GDP growth to the end of 2021. And so uh, uh, is that part of the context of our ask to them? You're seeing an economic growth that we can't realize, but we are serving the, pa the, the pandemic's um, most disadvantaged. And, and so we need some of that growth. 
For you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, part of the conversation that we've been having with them is, is sharing the analysis that has been done on the economic impact if we don't proceed with our capital plan. Um, so for context, uh, from, a, from 2017 data, which means that it actually would be worse, but from 2017 data, we know that for every million dollars we spend, it's nine jobs. So if you just do the simple math, 1.4 billion would be just over 12,600 jobs. If you think yeah. of 12,600 jobs, not only to the Toronto economy, um, to the Ontario economy, but that also is the economic engine for the, the country. So we are trying to emphasize that there is a significant impact on jobs um, that would actually have a material impact on the different economies as well. Right. So they're having GDP growth, but we're a big part of it. If we if we ended up having to backstop this budget with our capital, we would in fact hit their growth because uh, uh, we represent a huge number of jobs in the GTHA. That is what we have been sharing with them from a data perspective. Yes. Okay. And and the last piece of impact, I don't know if you've looked at these numbers. Again, it's the, the context of this briefing note against their reality that, that interests me. Um, I, I, I was just trying to pull it up, but I, I couldn't, but I, it was in one of the uh, federal pages where they track the spending of provinces on both a, uh, uh, on both a you know, real dollars basis and on a per capita basis. And in actual fact, the, Two provinces that have uh, had the most to deal with, uh, Ontario and British Columbia, um, on a per capita basis, they've spent the least of any province in mitigating the impacts of COVID. Not just their you know, health expenditures, but mitigation, which is largely supporting um, serving businesses affected and the poor and unemployed in, in, in their, their urban centres. And on a per capita basis, they're spending the least because there's a certain economy of scale and a certain efficiency of having major cities like Toronto and Vancouver. Um, can, can that be used in, in the context of our, for our uh, intergovernmental conversations? Through you, Mr. Chair, 100% councillor. Um, we are trying to emphasize the economic impacts of all of this, rather than just focusing on, you know, asking for an operating uh, subsidy. So we are trying to demonstrate the impacts if Toronto isn't continuing to contribute to okay. the, the economy. I'm going to try and get that uh, that for you. I can't find it right now, but it exists. So if I get it, I'm Thank going to you. send it to the CFO's office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Any other questions, Councillor Layton? Sure. Can we focus on those 1,200 jobs? So, 12,000 jobs, sorry. Um, what th Those jobs would primarily be private sector construction? So, let me clarify through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor. Um, when, when a million dollars is spent on capital infrastructure, it creates nine jobs. So, I should have clarified, thank you for asking the question, by spending on capital infrastructure, if we were to say we needed to use all our backstop and we were spending 1.4 billion on our backstop rather than on our capital, it would translate into over 12,600 jobs. So I'm trying to understand that where those jobs are. So your calculation on um, uh, on the number of jobs created, that includes both the direct employment and indirect, right? That's correct. And so, where would you where would you likely see most of those twelve thousand jobs being being lost? Well, as, as, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I would I would assume based on the fact that the infrastructure spend is being done in Toronto, uh, there would be a significant amount of the direct impact on the Toronto economy. The supply chain for that work would come from um, I would suspect. Ontario and Canada, but I, I don't have that specific information. But sorry, sorry, back to my original observation. So the direct jobs are primarily for the capital side in construction or professional services. I would say that the and then 
the when we look at where our capital spends are in primarily in transit in roads that you could make the assumption that it is based on construction jobs and engineering type professional services so are we doing anything to um to coordinate our efforts with those professions and and those and, and those private sector unions, the private sector itself uh, in construction, are we doing anything to coordinate the push? Because I suspect they have a lot to lose. Through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, I, I don't know from a political perspective uh, okay. what okay. lobbying is being done. Actually, if I can, through the chair, um, as we did in previous years, absolutely the unions are aware of our circumstance. And so uh, there is direct connection with them in terms of what's what's at stake for them, and if we don't get the support that we've had in the past. But not just our 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 local public sector unions. We're talking Leuna, the carpenters. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Good. 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 As long I, I just want to make sure they're aware, and and hopefully there's some kind of coordinated strategy to say there is a drop dead time where where contracts won't get signed this year. Last year. And the year before, was there a time frame for when we got commitments that we proceeded with work? Can you give us the rough time frame that we're, we should expect? March? Three, Mr. Chair, Councillor, for 2020, as you re, as you recall, um, we had we COVID surfaced two years ago. So we we started experiencing the pressures in Q2. Uh, we received commitments in August of that year. Last year, in in this budget phase, uh, we had had a commitment from the province on the transit funding that took us up until um, March 31st. Given the different year ends that the other governments have, commitments typically roll over. Um, so this is an unusual year in comparison to the last two. When is that point that we start not proceeding with summer work? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, as soon as the budget is approved, our capital work would normally be starting um, from a state of good repair perspective. We will be pausing 300 million of that as of February 17th when the budget is approved. So, so really we could be just postponing work that should be happening in March, April, April, May before the patio season. Then we're gonna rip up all the roads because the feds and the province couldn't get their act together. Sorry, I have one more question. There was a reported executive that asked about two potential funding sources. One was a percentage of the sales tax as it relates to the GTA and the city of Toronto. There are previous numbers that we've had in reports. Two questions. One, is there a scheduled report back on um, additional funding tools as was laid out in the long-term financial plan by the previous city manager? And two, is there um, what would the amount be if for example we got one percent on the sales tax in the city of toronto or two percent on the sales tax how much money would that be on an annual basis for you mr chair we can come back with that we have done that analysis yes, sir. um any other questions councillor mckelby just so it's crystal clear, what is the main driver behind this 1.4? You, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor, there are really four main buckets that are driving the 1.4 billion. We've got just over 560, so 561 um, from transit, which is is really reflecting lower ridership. We've got 288 million in our shelter system which is a reflection of the public health measures that have had to have been accommodated. And then we've got 266 million in corporate revenues. The corporate revenues reflect uh, dividends that are lower than pre-COVID years, such as Toronto Hydro, Toronto Parking Authority, as well as the municipal accommodation tax. And then in addition to that, and finally it's 60 million in public health measures that are being incurred due to uh, helping the province respond to the COVID-19 uh, scenario. Okay, and we can't be unique in terms of big cities to have these impacts, you know, Vancouver, Montreal, others, how are we working with them 
on this advocacy? So I, I yeah, I mean, I work regularly um, with uh, the major cities in Canada, and I can tell you when we first started, uh, the number one pressure that we all communicated and we still communicate to the federal government is around transit. Um, second to that would be housing, and maybe third to that would be uh, mental health and addiction. So uh, we're working together. In fact, we're working together right now on the uh, housing accelerator program to give the federal government advice on that. Uh, but equally important, we work with the uh, municipalities that surround us in the GTHA, which again, uh, not unlike our, our, our comparators uh, nationally, regionally, and to Heather's point, the, GT, the GTA, the GDP is about 25% of the country's GDP. So uh, we are working with all those municipalities, including regions uh, in the GTHA. And again, same story, transit, uh, pressures are ongoing, housing as well, and uh, and we talk about mental health and uh, digital divide. So uh, there's a lot of work going on amongst the senior administrators uh, with direct contact to FCM, uh, and we do provide um, input uh, to um, uh, other organizations here in uh, in in Ontario. But you know, I I, I have to tell you that. Um, you know, there is an opportunity and that's the way I look at it for the federal and provincial government to start uh, maybe in some of the more obvious places, uh, transit, certainly revenue being a problem for the foreseeable years. Uh, that would be a good place for us to start to have a conversation uh, as well as I would argue housing, mental health and addiction. So, um, you know, the um, that conversation is ongoing. So um, hopefully. Uh, as we get into the new term of council, we'll have some positive uh, signs from the federal and provincial government as to, you know, how it is that we can make, you know, funding in these areas sustainable. Okay. And then um, my colleagues had really good questions already. Um, just building on that in terms of construction and that that's the, the bulk hit here could be capital. Um, when does the construction season, you know, pretty much get started for like a lot of the road works and stuff like that. When did these Three. tenders all start going out? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor, the, the planning for that tendering work would be underway uh, with the hopes of hitting the spring construction season. So again, the, the budget deadline um, for the approval of February 17th is a really important date Covers. for us. I think depending on, um, you know, how much could be done, could be planned. And we probably are looking that if we go beyond Q1, uh, we will have lost the opportunity to uh, take advantage of the summer, spring, summer construction season. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, oh, Councillor Lai. Uh, all my, the questions uh, my colleagues are asking very good questions and some of my questions have been asked. I'm just wondering, just my last, just one, one quick question. How does the city revenue holding up? To you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor, in actual fact, we've done an analysis uh, since the onset of COVID and we have not experienced uh, a decline in our property tax revenues from a, a non-collectible perspective. So our recurring predictable revenues have not been impacted. As I mentioned, Revenues such as our corporate revenues uh, from parking, from uh, the municipal accommodation tax, which is the hotels, and from our dividends, that is all significantly lower. And the pressure that we're, we are attributing to, to COVID is about 266 million. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chair, That's my, that was my question. No problem, thanks. Uh, I I think, uh, I think we're done this one, Steve. Great, thanks. So uh, moving to section three of the wrap up notes. So uh, within this section, we've got uh, a series of briefing notes that have already been made available. They were made available to help supplement uh, the budget information that was provided uh, as of January 13th. Um, so I won't read through each and every one of these. These have been available for a couple of weeks now, but I'll pause here if there's any questions on any of these briefing notes. Councillor, start with Councillor Carroll. Um, yes, uh, questions on the uh, the user fee note. 
I think it is uh, briefing note number one. I'm racing to get back there because I was looking at something else. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I believe it's briefing note number one. Um, so most of the user fees, I went through the appendix on it. And, and most of the user fees are in the range of about uh, 2%. Sometimes uh, 2.18 is a common increase. And, and that's, that's, that's uh, everything from planning user fees, so largely impacting businesses, down to some of our recreation fees. And most of them are market-based. Um, uh, for instance, uh, rental of a space to run an adult breeding program, something like that. All, all of them are looking at usually 2.18% increases. What is the inflationary increase that we're, we're uh, applying to the budget for our uh, uh, community grants, the Community Partnership Investment Program? Uh, through the chair, I'll begin and um, uh, I can turn over, I believe uh, Denise may be available to speak to this as well. Uh, the community grants, uh, Denise, uh, you can take on, but I believe it's 1%. Yes, that's correct, Steve. So given that um, some of the programs that they offer, they have to, uh, they rent space from us, um, or they offer programs that, that are in line with some of the ones where we have user uh, fee increases, but we rely on those organizations to offer some of these programs because we did them all with city resources. We, we simply wouldn't have the funds to do it. They, uh, as I recall, years ago, we did a study and we found that uh, um, for about, uh, for I think it, at the time, it was something like $800,000 worth of uh, community grants delivered what, what the city would spend 80 million if they tried to deliver them themselves. But they do have inflationary impacts. Uh, so is there a reason? Why did we arrive at 1% for them, but we're willing to increase all of our own user fees to 2%? Uh, so my understanding is that the 1% reflects um, salaries, the COLA, if the COLA increases for salaries. Um, yes, that's my understanding about yeah, how right. So we're not accounting for if they have food costs, if they have increases in rent, and, it, and those don't factor into to how we might change the envelope. The reason I ask is because, you know, uh, they're grant programs. Anyone might apply in a given year, but some of our grant programs are now structured so that we have, you know, core services that we know have to survive uh, because they're delivering a service that we need delivered. So we have we have multi-year grants and, and then uh, uh, project-based uh, uh, single-year grants, but they most of the programs those grants deliver have the same inflationary impacts that our own staff departments do. Uh, yes, that would that would be the case. Um, so once council approves um, the inflationary increase, we then uh, increase all of our grant recipients to the same amount. Uh, and so for the last few years, that has been the 1%. So what happens is, uh, so what happens is you have, if I can just flesh this out, your envelope goes up by 1%, but when people apply for a grant, they have to provide detailed financial statements. It's a very detailed thing. So if, for instance, it's a grant that where, where the program is delivered uh, with food, Food is often what you use to get people in that 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 need the service, but but won't come unless you attract them with food. So, if they're applying and factoring in what their real costs are, if we don't raise the envelope uh, uh, by by real inflation, what you get are core groups applying for increases that exceed the one percent, which means you're able to award grants to fewer and fewer organizations unless we try and keep pace with inflation. Am, am I right in assuming that? Yes, I believe so, Councillor. To your point, I mean, the cost of, uh, of paying salaries, of programming, all of those things continue to rise uh, for our community partners, similar to um, uh, the, the rest of us in terms of service delivery. And we constantly are trying to make do within uh, the existing portfolio to meet all the needs that our funded agencies have. But of course, that's beyond the city's ability to meet all those needs. 
So that will that will propel us back to the situation we were in. Am I right? In 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 assuming that we're going to end up back where we were in 2004, 2000 through 2007, really right up until we we started to to be able to breathe a bit because we had the land transfer tax. We weren't allowing increases, and each year one or two of our favorite community agencies just dropped off the list. There just wasn't enough money, and so they didn't get their grant that year. And that group disappears. Last question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think on this piece, um, my team's just reminded me that the traditional approach that um, council has used around COLA and used this year um, has been to match um, the city COLA increase uh, for the grant funded agencies. If council wishes to change that approach, then there is an opportunity to do so. Okay, but Thanks. well, that was my last question. But uh, you know, I do have I do have other questions about what is the cola increase, uh, Mr. Chair? Because user fees, it seems to be two percent. Budgets seem to be being raised by two and three percent. You know, the police are are, are getting three percent, and and some of our bargaining unit contracts are in the two percent range. I don't understand where this one percent is coming from. Uh, but uh, but uh, you're right. I'm I'm out of town. I guess I'll, I'll have to wait till the final wrap up to okay. say Thank something you. or move a motion. Okay. Um, seeing, oh, Councillor Layton. Yes. Thank you very much. And this to Denise. I do we know what portion of the CPIP uh, grant goes to salaries? I don't have that information off the top, but uh, I could certainly uh, see if we can pull that out for you, Councillor, and share that. But I would and say a significant does, portion, uh, just yeah. given the way social services work. Does any does anything in the CPIP grants guarantee that the um, that what we fund these organizations that their salaries need to be uh, need to be capped at inflation, or that the that their sorry that their cola needs to be one percent and not the inflationary rate. No, I do, I don't believe that there is like a policy around that, um, Councillor Layton. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, do, do we know what the increase to the fair wage rate was between 2022 and 2021? I'm looking to my colleagues in finance. Uh, through the chair, I, I don't have that information. We'd have to look into that. I, um, uh, I may be able to add, I know there were some questions around inflation. So generally the approach as it relates to the grants is recognizing uh, the need to add funds uh, traditional approach as we as we speak to inflation is tying it to the inflation identified within our our collective agreements, and that's what's done again this year at one percent. When we look at the the user fees, user fees is a bit of a different methodology. We're trying to ensure we're maintaining our level of cost recovery, so we're looking at what we deem a basket of goods, and the idea is looking at all of the costs associated with providing that service and and reflecting an increase in our user fees to maintain that level of recovery. Sorry, so we 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 link it to um the increases that we see in our collective agreements uh that's that's the traditional approach that's been taken over the last few years which collective agreements uh generally the agreements within our, our 416 and 79. not to some of the ones that are above inflation Uh, police, I, again, for example, police, fire. Uh, again, it's the like I said, the traditional approach is looking specifically at those those two uh, those two groups. And what was the last collective agreement? What were the numbers in in four and six and seventy nines? Uh, for twenty twenty two, the amount is a one percent associated with coal. And twenty twenty one, I believe it was one percent as well. And there, there was there were years over over one percent in their last collective agreement. I'm trying to remember which ones. 
Uh, I'd have to go back and look into uh, the history. I believe it, it was uh, stepped up somewhat over a couple of years, but I have to go back and look into it. And what was the last sort of four years? We're, we're in what, what year of what for the collective agreement? I think we're in three. I believe we're in year three of, of four. Of five. Of five. So when did we move? Uh, I thought we moved to five. Give me a moment. I think I have some details. Yeah, we I are veering slow. On. <clears throat> we're veering away off on the uh, particular note. By the way, well, what I'm trying to what, what I'm what I'm trying to to understand is. I'm sorry, are we sure the increase was, was one? I'm looking at the collective agreement right now, 2020. And this is for 416. 2020, I see a 1.9. There's a one in front of it, but it certainly doesn't round to 1.9. I, I wanna check your work, Steve. Uh, through the chair, uh, we'll go back and we'll we'll pull all the data. I'm going off memory. I thought uh, my recollection it was one percent in the first year, but I'll have to go back and double check the data. So, so I'm seeing one point nine, one point seven, one point seven, one point nine, one point nine. Because I was one point nine nine. I I think it would be useful for us to have a better understanding of of the uh, the, the the differences between and so just remind me. In, in in this in the CPIP inflationary increase, has that it's it's been one percent for the last couple of years? I know that has it ever been any more in the last five years? So yeah, uh, yes, councillor. In uh, five years ago, let's see, twenty eighteen it was two point one percent, twenty nineteen it was the same, twenty twenty it was two point zero six percent. So we've got come off three years of doing closer to inflationary increases, closer to the collective agreements, and now we have, a, we're, we're halving it. I've totally forgot we were at two last year. I have to, I have to say it, I'm, I, I'm a little embarrassed I didn't remember that. Um, okay, we, we can leave it here for now, I'm over time, but I, I think this is still an open conversation. So um, just, just be prepared that we'll have questions about this in the next round. Okay, thanks. Uh, and, and through the chair, so I do have some history here, so uh, maybe we can touch base. Uh, I am looking at 1% increases uh, associated with uh, Local 79 and 416 in each of the years 2020, 2021, and 2022. And in 2023, it would step up to 1.5, and then I think there might be a secondary quarter of a percent step up, but uh, happy to connect with you and, and run through the numbers. Thanks, uh, Steve, and thanks, Councillor. Any other questions on this section, section three? Okay, Steve, let's go on to the next quickly. Oh, these are section four, okay. Uh, thank you. So moving on to section four. So section four, um, there's some further briefing note requests that are expected to come back to uh, the final wrap up meeting of February 7th. Um, as I said, these are expected to come forward. In fact, uh, there's two that have recently been submitted and we're just doing our final reviews and formatting uh, and uh, will definitely be available shortly for, uh, for submission to council. Great, thank you. Um, members, just to sort of, I'm looking at the time here. Um, the next section, and this is kind of getting into overall questions of, um, and it's, it's in, in order of presentation, community services, public health, TRCHC infrastructure development, the agencies. So we're going to go through, as we've done in years past, sort of go through a run through again, more general questions. I'm not going to go into, into each of the individual divisions, just the overall areas. Um, we usually get through this historically fairly quickly. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, do we, we take the hour? Do we just take a half hour? Um, and I just want to give the everyone staff wise online a sense of maybe when they're going to be coming up or not. So I'm just running. I mean, we have 15 minutes. We can we can do uh, maybe community and social services right now to see where we go and just sort of read things. I'm just throwing it out to the uh, committee. Um, if you want to take the hour, if anybody has meetings, um, we can maybe do a half hour. As I said, this generally goes fairly quickly, but I you, you can never tell. 
everyone's good with i'm just councillor mccalvey um just the agencies specifically they get called out individually or as a group no they'll be individually so again the way we did it so okay. the toronto transit police library will be asking overall questions of those so and they may take a little bit of time but uh, mr um uh, clerk uh, matthew you wanted to comment i'm just trying to figure out we, um, we also have a motion prepared uh, to extend the meeting um, past 12:30. I mean, you, if you wanted to extend to one o'clock yeah. or something like that. I don't uh, think, frankly, I don't think we'll get through everything by one o'clock. If we were close to get everything through, I think we'll have to take a break. Um, is everyone fine if we just? And I'm just thinking um, on a staff side too. There's a lot of staff here. Uh, if we take a half hour break, then we could probably get done a half hour early this afternoon. Is that a possibility? Okay, Miss, do we need a motion for that then, um, Matthew? Just to, would to take a half hour break? Yes. So why don't, why don't we do that? Maybe if you can just say the say the motion, so we'll take a um, that the that the committee recess at twelve thirty and return yeah, we'll, and resume. We'll just one move that the recess uh, committee uh, recesses at twelve thirty, comes back at one p.m. Exactly. Okay. And if you can take that vote, that would be great for us. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Um, again, just on, so on the staff online, that'll hope to get us through um, um, quicker. So we got uh, we got 15 minutes. So what I will do, um, I'm going to go. So I'm just going to go through the in order of presentation. First area is community and social services. So these are overall questions. And just to let you know, within community and social services, you have children's services, ECDEV, housing secretary, Toronto employment and social services, paramedics, parks, shelter service, housing court services, senior services, and social development. Now, we has asked a lot of questions as part of the briefing notes, but now we're just going to go, is there any overall questions in any areas of uh, community and social services? Councillor Layton. Uh, yes, on, uh, I have some questions of um, Gord Tanner for shelters. Okay, sounds good. So if we can, um, we'll, we'll start with that then, uh, social, uh, with Gord. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, Gord, I know we asked some of these questions at the last time around, and I asked for a briefing note. Unfortunately, my colleagues on budget committee didn't grant me the request, but can we talk a little bit about how fast and what barriers there are to, um, to activating more housing allowances? What's available? As we heard we have 7,000 people in emergency shelters at, a, at an enormous cost to the city, as well as not particularly dignified circumstances. What challenges exist to activating more and what resources could we put in to a faster a, a, a faster um, activation of rent supplements? Uh, through the chair, councillor. So we have, as I think I mentioned, uh, a new line of funding coming from the uh, federal and provincial governments called uh, uh, Cobb program, which will support up to 1500 people starting in April. So we are in the process currently of designing that program, which we will uh, see provided deeper benefit to individuals who are uh, experiencing chronic homelessness to assist them to buy down, uh, you know, private market rents. Um, part of that work needs to include partnering with private market landlords so we can ensure there is available units um, to match people with. And strategies may include um, taking on a head lease arrangement with a private market landlord so we take a number of units in their portfolio, make sure that we backstop the rent to the landlord and support those tenants as they move into housing. So is that something we currently do or we're going to need someone to do that? So our staff through the chair, our staff are currently working on the design of that program. We have done this in the past, Councillor, through projects such as the at home Chez Swa project. Uh, we have been using housing allowances for a, a period of time, many years now. But what we found laterally is the depth of that allowance is not uh, sufficient to uh, purchase a private market rent given the current cost of private market housing. So we are designing this new program to provide a deeper subsidy um, and uh, arranging uh, to provide additional supports to tenants as they move into those uh, units when they're made available. And how many units do you think we'll be able to activate in, a, in, in the shorter term using this? 
so we have 1500 allowances you know our work needs to start now with those private market landlords to identify what units are available of course um you know this is a forecast that we'll have starting in april as the winter ends and be very focused on on moving these these folks out of some of our winter programs and some of our our hotel programs uh the rent supplements are also portable or the housing allowances if you will are portable uh so that people could also leave the jurisdiction of the city of toronto if if they should find cheaper accommodation in a gtha community um, and then finally, in addition to this, you know, it, it's our it's our current programs that we have with Toronto Community Housing and rapid access to their vacant units um, that will be stepped up as we uh, as we head towards the spring also. And you have the staff complement to to implement the program as you've outlined. We have the staff in our shelters, our counseling staff to to uh, work with with the clients in the shelter system and our coordinated access uh, staff to identify those individuals um, that will be eligible based on their length of time in the shelter system. Um, we will need to continue to look at the support side of this equation <clears throat> because, of course, um, you know, to make these tenants successful, you know, we're going to need to support people as they move into these new units. Uh, they're going to need to be furnished and we're going to need to support them as they transition into their new communities. Um, the rent bank. Uh, have there been occasions through COVID where the rent bank hasn't been able to meet the need that exists? Um, so through through the chair councillor, not at this time. We have sufficient funding and float an additional three million dollars to the rent bank program. The other change that has been uh, ongoing in a pilot sort of approach is that we've changed to provide grants instead of loans to the tenants that are eligible for those services. Um, that's something that will continue uh, into. 2022, but we'll need to continue to monitor the availability of those funds to ensure that, you know, there is sufficient uh, grants there to support tenants that access that service. So, and if I could, that $3 million that was floated internally by SSHA, where did the money come from? Um, the three million dollars, I believe, was uh, part of the COVID relief funding we got from the province, um, the COVID SSRF, uh, Social Service Relief Fund, um, and we'll be utilizing that again in 2022 as part of our our COVID pressure. Thanks, guys. Great, thank you. Any other seen any other questions? Um, I'll just I said I have a couple of questions on EPDEV. Uh, Please, if I can, so the uh, Dev and Culture Department. Um, part of, as we heard through the um, deputations um, a couple of days ago, um, talking about the idea of pulling a culture plan together. Can you just talk to me about where, if that is on the intent or intentions of pulling together a, a culture plan or a revised new culture plan for the city? Thank you, Councillor Crawford, thank you for your question. We are absolutely intent on looking at a new culture plan for ECDEV. Uh, we are trying to figure out the way that we can do that in a robust fashion so that we have uh, the kind of consultation um, and engagement that we would expect and the community would expect from us, so yes. Okay, great. Um, as also mentioned too, uh, maybe part of uh, the culture plan, I'm not sure, but it's similar to what we do with music and film is having a, a new live arts development officer. Has that been contemplated, looked at? Uh, again, it was brought up as part of the um, deputation process. Through you, uh, Councillor Crawford, yes, there is a, a intention to look at the staffing that supports live music and, and basically the um, sector in general. Uh, the film office, which is led by Marguerite Piggott, is looking at uh, she's looking at her overall resourcing to support the community. Uh, so we did not have a specific ask in this budget, as you will have seen for that position, but we are making plans to support that kind of addition of support. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions of this overall area? Community and social services? If not, we can uh, probably make sense for us to. So just let everybody know we have, again, in order of uh, presentations uh, that they went, we'll start at one o'clock with Toronto Public Health, uh, Toronto Community Housing, do the accountability officers, infrastructure development, then we'll get into TTC, police, library, 
and they will end up with all the other agencies. That's kind of the, the run through at one o'clock if that works for everybody. Don't think we've missed anything. Okay, um, so why don't we, um, and then, then if, if there's any briefing note requests, I think there was one, I think Council McKelvey, you put in a briefing note request, so, okay. Okay, why don't we uh, break till it's 1225. Why don't we just break till one o'clock then, if that works. Okay, we're in recess till one. Thanks everyone, see you in a bit. I think we are, Mr. Clerk, uh, just want to make sure we're ready. We're streaming. To the chair, this is the host. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, welcome back, everybody. Now we had a quick lunch. Um, we're trying to get done a little bit early this afternoon. Um, Councilor Kerry, you just mentioned that you, you may have a few, another question. I know we whipped through community and social services pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Your question, hopefully the right uh, staff member would still be with us. Uh, I hope so. Um, I think it's finance staff I want to speak to because I, I looked something up. Um, we were talking earlier when we were dealing with, you know, inflationary increases, user fees, et cetera. We ended up, we, we, we veered off into talking about the, uh, the various grant streams in, in uh, CPIP. Um, and they're spread all over the place, I know. Um, I think it was Mr. Conforti said, said if, I, if I went back as far as 2018, it was 2.1%. And that got me looking. We made a policy change at one point. I'm wondering if you can correct me. Where we were, we were the reason they got 2.1 is we were looking at the actual basket of goods, um, which is you know the real impact on on you know a lot of the if it's community and social development types of grants. Those are the things that impact the costs of the, of what they deliver. And then we changed it and we said we were we we made a policy change to say it was directly in line with with whatever we were offering as COLA. To non union staff. Am I right? Uh, through the chair, I'll have to, I, I would need to work with SDFNA to go back on the policy in terms of um, where the decision was. I know that there was uh, consideration similar to a lot of the different um, uh, grants that are provided across the city to have it in line with our COLA amounts. I'm pretty sure that's why it is because we, we sort of switched, we moved into the new term and began to use that as uh, as a as a measure because it because it because I it lines up in this term with with that amount the the challenge that i have is this i don't even know why we're still calling that a cost of living adjustment because even if we're whether we're talking about salaries or we're talking about grants that's not cost of living and won't be for the foreseeable future so um while we made a policy change in the current climate where we know the Bank of Canada is, Canada is going to start to climb things, we've got global impacts on food costs, et cetera. Now what we're, we're using as a measure to decide what to, uh, to do with their envelope each year is it, going to cause a disaster in, in two to three years. I, I don't think I'm exaggerating if, I, if we continue to use that measure. And we don't really offer a cost of living adjustment. We just offer what we can afford to our our, our staff for CPIP, that's a disaster. So 
would it require a, a policy change, a whole policy change to, to offer any other, any different increase to the community partnership and investment program? So through the chair, I may turn to Denise uh, to speak to that. So from my understanding right now, uh, Councilor Carroll, it's, um, I believe that it's a, it's a finance directive yes. that um, determines what our increase can be uh, for uh, CPIP in this way, as opposed to asking for a new and enhancement. So uh, it's a finance directive as opposed to council's policy. Well, council approves. Um, council approved of, of what um, what the increase would be. So I'm right. not sure. I'm sorry, I don't have precision on what the mechanism would be to change it. But it is a council decision around what the increase, the annual increase, is to the program. So the best that I could find in a half an hour, if we can just ask one more question of finance staff, maybe I maybe I have to dig deeper. The best that I can find in a half an hour is that this is not so much policy as we change the measure, apply to a different increase one year, and we gave tacit approval as opposed to, to a policy motion simply by adopting the, the budget that year with this new, um, new uh, 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 type of increase to, to that envelope. So um, are we, are we able to order briefing notes, Mr. Chair, or is this something that I should simply go to staff and work on uh, offline with them between now and the 7th? Um, you could do either or. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So if you want to put in a quick briefing note, if not, I, um, I think staff have said they could work on that. So if you're there. Why don't I work with staff and yourself in the mayor's office for that matter? I just simply think there are enough programs within that, that program that if we use that measure for this year and, and a couple more, we really will be granting to far fewer community organizations and the, okay. the impact will start to lead to random motions as opposed to an approach. <laughs> okay, I hear you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, I'm gonna jump over to, uh, again, I said, uh, just go through the order of, as they were presented last week. Um, questions of Toronto Public Health. Okay, Toronto Community Housing Corporation. Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we just uh, heard about SafeTO at the executive. It's coming to council next week. So I'm just wondering if um, Toronto Community Housing could speak to how they're looking to integrate into that work or into what resources they may be bringing to the table for it. Do we have Toronto Community Housing Corporation with us? To the chair, hi, it's uh, Raymond from Toronto Community Housing. Um, I can quickly speak to this. I'm hoping my colleague Nadia is on the call. She'll be able to provide a little more in terms of details with regards to the SafeTO. Um, we also released a briefing memo uh, with regards to this. I believe it was yesterday. Um, but ultimately, uh, we are working with um, SDFA with regards to the various programs uh, for SafeTO. Um, we are in talks with them, uh, specifically with uh, Scott McKeon, who's of SafeTO, um, and devising various programs in terms of what uh, TCHC can do in order to help support this, the overall SafeTO uh, program. Okay, and then um, where you where are you at in terms of reactivating space for program um, for the community? For example, um, some of the TCHC end units and creating you know these these spaces uh, that could be used by youth. Um, is there anything in this year's budget uh, towards renovating and fixing up some of those spaces? Uh this program is fairly new and we are again, as I mentioned, uh, it speaks in discussions with um, SDFA with regards to how we can support that. We do have dollars in terms of providing various uh, programs for violence reduction, um, youths, et cetera. Um, as, uh, with regards to 
dollars put towards uh, renovating buildings. I would have to get back to you on that. Okay, great. Um, if you could, maybe we can just get that offline, but I know um, some of the NG units that are used for a community space, um, you know, have been closed for some time and there's thoughts to reopen them. So if anything's in the budget for that this year, it'd be good to know. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, seeing no other questions for TCHC, um, accountability officers. Any questions? And we had a number of questions already, I think. Okay, next we'll go to infrastructure development services. Again, just to remind everybody that city planning, MLS, Toronto Fire, Transportation, Engineering and Construction, Office of Emergency Manage Management, PPFA, Toronto Building, Tran Transit Expansion, and Waterfront Revitalization. So any general questions on uh, the infrastructure and development? Okay. Next, uh, three agencies next, uh, TTC, police, and library. Any overall, quite, we had a number of questions already on TTC as part of the briefing notes, but I'll do some overall questions of TTC. Councillor McKelvey, then Lai. And sorry, then... Uh, sorry, Mr. Mr. Yep. Chair. Sure. Um, I'm a little confused when, when you were talking about questions. When you said any, did you mean the whole cluster infrastructure? Yes. Yeah, so I thought that's, you yeah, meant as, you were going to go next C to engineering, construction, and services. I had, I had a question for okay. ACS. So let's go back. No problem. I, I know. Uh, yeah, I just did as we did community social services, the whole whole cluster. So why don't okay. we go back? Let's go back. No Sorry. Problem. Um, okay. It's Council just Carol. ACS, and that's okay. that's it. Okay. Um, it. And I hope they're still here. <laughs> still here, Councillor. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Mr. D'Andrea, we, I, I asked you questions when, back when we were doing the, the public reviews last week, um, about hiring additional people. Um, you, you have in your budget and actually, in fact, had it in last year's budget, you're, are, but are still catching up, um, hiring additional people to keep, uh, pace with the, the extra demands on you to, to, uh, uh, review and comment on development applications. Uh Yes. So what I'm wondering is this: Are they? Um, are they? Is that initiative protected over and operating, or would they? If we are put in this difficult position that the the CFO has has outlined for us, if we're in the difficult position of having to defer capital work, and you've got to start to rejig things um, that that ECS plays a role in, are those staff uh, uh, positions that are over? to one side doing as much development uh, um, uh, commenting and review as is necessary so that infrastructure can keep pace with, with development. Um, would, would that uh, holding back of funds from capital uh, impact your department in that particular part of the department in any way? Uh, through the chair counselor, uh, so far as the development engineering positions are concerned, they are recovered through development application fees. So okay. they're protected in that respect. So they're a direct charge back to, uh, to those fees. Okay. So then the only, then the only, uh, uh, place where there is an impact there, if correct me, if I'm wrong, and this, this ends up impacting the whole infrastructure cluster is if we have to start delaying capital, we may see the delay of some of the very infrastructure projects that need to be in place to keep pace with the, the development growth in the city and the housing that, that the premier wants so badly for us to build near transit stations. Would uh, so that be a chair, risk? Counselor. Well, there, 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 there may be a risk. I think the point that I, I want to emphasize is that, you know, one of the major servicing bottlenecks that we usually have is with respect to the water and wastewater servicing. Yeah. And so because that budget has been approved, so we're in, in good shape in that respect. So we're, free and clear in terms of issuing uh, those tenders. On the transportation side, um, uh, many, much of the work that we have underway, uh, critically important. So for example, our, 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 our bridge state of good repair program working on behalf of transportation or yeah. our roads program might be somewhat vulnerable. You know, I'd have to defer that those questions to transportation in respect to uh, conversations they had with, uh, with the finance in respect to what might uh, have to be uh, parked for the time being and so far as that if that funding isn't available, but most of our work, our program is, is well underway and program for 2022. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Let's flip uh, back over to 
TTC. I think I saw Councillor McKelvey and Lai. Councillor McKelvey for Toronto Transit TTC. Councillor McKelvey. Uh, so, sorry, which agency? I had a question for library. Oh, okay. Sorry, we're doing TTC first. No, no. I thought you were calling all the agencies at the same time. No, no, My no. Apologies. I'll go through those individually as the big agencies. Um, Councillor Lai, you had a question for TTC? No, okay. I apologize. Okay, then we'll go on to Toronto Public uh, Toronto. Let's try that again. It's, a long, it's been a long day. Toronto Police Services. Toronto Police, uh, Councillor Lai, then Carol. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a quick question for TPS. Uh, given the amount of uh, hate crime that are happening in Toronto, I'm just wondering what kind of resources uh, the TPS is putting in to the hate crime unit, or are there any other things that you would be, uh, with this year's budget, that you, you would be investing in the hate crime unit or you know, towards hate crime? Thank you for the, the question, uh, Councillor. Uh, it's Tony Veneziano from the, from the TPS. We actually have four uh, officers in our hate crime units right now. We are going to be expanding that, adding at least another two. Um, we know it's a priority for us just in terms of the spike in hate crimes that we see across the city. Uh, so we will be expanding in that area uh, within our existing budget. So it's a matter of, of actually redeploying some of our officers to uh, actually meet the needs uh, in terms of hate crime pre prevention and, and actually bringing some of those people to justice. So. Um, we definitely are going to be expanding, uh, expanding the program. The chief is committed to that. And again, it will be done within our existing resources. Yeah, just, just uh, uh, on the follow up question, I hope some of these uh, uh, officers would speak the different languages because, you know, given the situation on some of the Asian crime and all that, I think uh, just so that uh, wanted to make sure that some of them can cater to some of the multi language people, uh, residents. So I'm not aware of that, like in, in terms of who's actually in the unit, but certainly it's something that I can bring back to the chief in command uh, to uh, to certainly consider. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Those um, that was my question. Okay, thanks, Councillor uh, McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So likewise, the same question that I had for TCHC, the city had uh, CPTO and executive this week comes to council next week. Um, how are Toronto police um, dedicating resources towards this plan? What will your involvement be? So thank you for, for the question. We are committed to working as part of the SAFETO uh, team. I'm going to refer your question to the chief's uh, strategic advisor, James Cormish. Uh, who will certainly uh, give you the information I think that you require. James? So let me set my uh, audio here. Thanks, uh, Tony. Uh, yes, uh, the it's hard to actually quantify our, our commitment to SAFETO at this time. A lot of the initiatives are new. Uh, uh, they're not well formed, if formed at all yet, uh, but we certainly are are proceeding uh, uh, at a rapid pace at doing our best to make sure it, it succeeds. A lot of uh, what SAFETO uh, is geared at is really to um, change the way services uh, that relate to public safety are delivered. Uh, they don't really change the fact uh, that that the police have been involved in these areas for quite some time. So it's it's hard to parse out exactly what the effort is associated with safe TO, uh, because a lot of these things we're already doing. Take for example the uh, gang gun and gang initiative. Uh, you know we were involved in policing in that area for quite some time. It is an integral part of safe TO, and we're helping with that for sure. Uh, and we did something together with the city last year uh, on a pilot basis that probably will be repeated this year, but we don't know exactly what it looks like. So the, we, we can report eventually on our uh, effort on safety O, uh, but we're not, uh, we're not set up quite yet to be able to quantify it. Okay, um, I'll take that um, under advisement, but uh, next year, like I, I will, be asking if I'm here again, um, asking for a briefing note on that so that we can start to track that 
that transformation and alignment of your resources internally towards that. I recognize you're doing many of those things, but I think it, it'd be nice to see what that interface is, what that involvement is, how you're connecting into the safety networks, for example, that are happening on the ground. Um, okay. My next question is about the 25 million for case management. I'm wondering if you can uh, explain why case management is important. Uh, what is what is it that that will involve and, and those resources will do? So just uh, as a point of clarification, Councillor, we're actually asking for about $2.3 million uh, in, in uh, the 22 budget ask. Uh, that's basically uh, to start uh, uh, and, and hiring about 15 people uh, to actually get the whole uh, thing going. Uh, we could go up as high as, as 80, but what we wanted to do is phase it in and really just uh, start with the 15, assess where we're at, see what's required uh, in terms of meeting what is a critical gap and was identified as a critical gap in terms of our miss, how we deal with missing uh, uh, and miss, missing persons in our in our community, so we definitely this is a must. We have to do it. It's our only new initiative in the budget. We're asking for two point three million dollars this year, and then we will assess and basically include in our ask for twenty twenty three in terms of any additional resources that we would require. Okay, so. Apologies, I thought your increase this year you're asking for was 25 million. You're asking for 2.3 million. So the 25 million is actually what our budget is ask is going up by. Okay. Uh, the 2.3 million is the part that's related to uh, major case management and the power case software. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carroll. Hi, yes. Um, uh, you've answered uh, some of my questions already, Tony. Uh, we just we just uh, uh, painted the picture for power case. So what's in the budget right now is you expect to start hiring for this thing about halfway through the year, and you you need to hire 40 of the positions up front? No, so actually we're actually gonna be hiring before that. We're hoping to start the hiring in the first quarter of this year, but we'll only be hiring 15 this year. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, that's, that, yes, this is what I was, uh, it was in my mind that Chief Raymer in the review had, had said something about, I think I'm only going to need 12 to 15 to start with, but he mean before you, he means before you even get to the 40. Yeah, and I think just to give you some context, when 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 uh, Just, Justice Epstein's report came forward uh, and, and made the recommendation, this was a key recommendation. So the chief in command yeah. basically thought at that time that we would need prox approximately uh, around 80, right? As we got more information and as we, you know, the, the whole, our thinking around this sort of changed, we, we felt it best to go forward with 15 to start with and then really see how much we, how many people we will ultimately need. And that would form part of our 23 budget request, including in terms of complement, as well as additional funding that we're going to require. So to be clear, Justice Epstein, Epstein wanted us to have a more, uh, um, uh, uh, that, that you, you could reach across to 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 uh, other uh, policing districts. He 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 thought we should be more integrated in the exchange of information, so that important information on major cases and missing persons didn't disappear. He said you should do that. Get a new thing. I I don't know that we can. I don't know that we can land on Justice Epstein. The fact that what we ended up with is the this provincially mandated software called Power Case that turns out to need. Pardon me for saying this, but it seems like an insane number of people to run it. That eventually it's going to take 80 officers to run a new information system is kind of mind boggling in the context of how few positions we'll, we ever allow as we, we embark on major tech initiatives here at the city. I, I, I need to understand why we need 40 people halfway through the year and how that's going to turn into 80 for what is essentially uh, a new uh, software management and, and data banking system. So again, I don't, we're not at the 40 or the 80, we're at 15 right now. And that- I, I, I absolutely understand that, but I'm also painfully aware that 2.3 million is just the six months worth of dollars for the 40 people. And so if, if it comes to fruition that you do need them, the annualization of power case management is pretty significant next year. Uh, Tony, it's James here. Yeah, perhaps, right. so, perhaps I can answer a part of this question for Councillor Carroll. Uh, Councillor, actually, Justice Epstein referred to 
uh, power case and major case management in her report uh, because it is a provincial standard. It's required yeah. on all cases that may be linked to a serial offender. And it comes as a result of the inquest in, inquiry into Paul Bernardo's activities in the city back in the 90s, where he was found to be a serial rapist and a serial murderer. Yep. And in order to ensure that we captured as much information and shared it as best we can across the province, because these folks don't stick to city boundaries, uh, that they they mandated provincially this case management software. So it's not voluntary. Uh, and unfortunately, what makes the software so labor intensive? That's that's it's, what it's, I'm trying to get at. Yeah. I know so, what it so, does, and we want it to do mm -hmm. that. But I'm just trying to understand why it takes so many humans to run the computer. Well, your your concern is widely shared throughout the policing community, I can tell you. And there are uh, constant efforts. I used to be the assistant deputy attorney general uh, on the criminal law side. And I sat on a provincial board that gave advice to the ministry of the solicitor general about power case. And there's constant requests to make it more user friendly. Uh, to make it quicker, uh, but it, it it still remains this piece of software that is very, very labor intensive. And there are, if we look to like OPP, they, they use it extensively and they devote a lot of resources to it. it it's just a fact of life, uh, unfortunately. And unfortunately, the chief has admitted a number of times that we've fallen down on our requirement to use this software. And it was called out in Justice Epstein's report. Okay, I, I, I'm i going to need a little more information. So uh, last couple of questions. Sorry, Mr. Chair, to belabor this. Fine. But the, okay. the initial 12 to 15, are they part of the 40? Or are they on top of the 40? Are we really looking at 55 new positions? Or is, is 15 part of 40? I think, and I'll just, I'll just start, uh, going back again, we thought it was going to be 40 civilians, 40 uniforms back when Justice yeah. Epstein put a report forward. Since then, though, we've determined that we should start with 15 and it may become 30, it may stay at 15, it may become 80. But right now we're dealing with 15 and we're going to come back to both the board and then obviously city council in terms of our additional ask, if there is one, as part of the 23 budget. Um, so we're, we're sort of phasing it in and so we oh, don't want to ask see. for 80 or 40 when perhaps we're not even going to need that number, right? So we're starting with 15 and then phasing it in. And as we get more information in terms of exactly what the requirements are, uh, both, you know, from both a civilian as well as a, a, a uniform officer perspective, we'll come back to, we'll, we'll go back to the board, update them and that report will obviously make its way to city council. Okay. Uh, sorry to grill you like that. Tony. No, it's okay. Thank you for that information, though. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Nunziata is next. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, if uh, maybe James can answer to Tony, but um, as far as the gun violence that uh, we're having, um, you know, um, in certain parts of the city, um, we are um, we are working and we are we are advancing and we're working with the community. Um, and we're redeploying staff. So we're not hiring any staff as far as the number of gun violence that we have, that we are redeploying staff into these problem areas, correct? Well, I'll start and then maybe James can pitch in. We have implemented, the chief has implemented the centralized sh shooting response team uh, that has carriage over all of these uh, shootings and homicides that are occurring. James, did you want to add uh, any, anything to that? Uh, you're, you're, uh... Your thought is correct, uh, Councillor Nunziata. The uh, the chief uh, and the service I haven't asked. There are no new asks in this budget, other than for the power case uh, piece that we spoke of with just uh, with uh, Councillor Carroll. But uh, the chief is actively and aggressively, frankly, redeploying within the service to try to meet particular needs. Gun gun violence is is one of the key ones on his list. And uh, like what Tony has said is is accurate about the central central shooting response team, but there are various other things that we'll be doing throughout the course of the year to to combat 
uh, gun violence. And one of them is to work with the PMAT Toronto on, on Safe TO to devise a strategy for uh, this coming year. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make that clear to members. And as well, we have, we're working very closely with uh, Toronto Housing because a number of these homicides are within and around Toronto Housing buildings. I had three in my ward last weekend. Um, but just to get back to the question that Councillor McKelvey had, the increase, the 23 or the 24 million, it, you're not, it, it's not adding um, staffing. It's actually uh, for uh, staffing salaries. And so you're not adding any staff. We're not hiring any additional staff. And the increase is salaries. Correct, yeah, Tony? The only thing, so the only thing that we're adding, Councillor, is the, uh, the 15 or and the 2.3 million dollars right. for the power case uh everything else really the a good portion of our increase uh probably 95 percent of it is for uh for cola increases That's so right. uh, out of the 25 million 24 million is just related to cola yeah just to and make so that we're clear absorbing the rest of the uh of our uh, priorities yeah just to make that clear so we're not hiring more staff except for you know that two million so um, that's the reason for the increase. I, because I, I know that Councillor McKelvey was asking that question, and I just want to make that clear because there seems to be an understanding out there that we're making, we're adding more, more police officers, which we're not. No, Actually, that's we're, correct, doing, we're we're doing more by redeploying officers in these problem areas. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, this area plus we're expanding in terms of neighborhood community officers to the extent that we can. Uh, we talked about hate crimes before. Uh, so we are looking at different areas where we can actually hit, uh, address those priorities within our existing resources. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, seeing no more questions, uh, we'll go to Toronto Public Library. Um, Councillor McKelvey, you had questions on the library, didn't you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so my question is, what does the Toronto Public Library offer in terms of uh, dig digital literacy sorts of programs. Mr. Chair, hi, Pam Ryan here from, from Toronto Public Library. Um, in terms of, of digital literacy programs for all age groups or for a specific- Well, maybe all, but specifically seniors. Uh, for seniors, we uh, do, for when, when our, our services are available in person, we do have seniors specific digital literacy programming uh, in certain branches. Through the pandemic, we have offered digital literacy support services through uh, telephone service and through online. Are any of those programs currently being offered being cut this year? No, they are not. Okay. Um, what enhancements are you asking for through this budget? We're asking for um, a, a budget enhancement to fund the uh, initiative that is uh, outlined in the Toronto Senior Strategy. Uh, it's recommendation four in the Toronto Senior Strategy for digital literacy for seniors in Toronto community housing buildings. So uh, community librarians to bring uh, digital literacy services to uh, some of the most vulnerable seniors in the city where they live. Sorry, you're asking for that as an enhancement this year? That is the enhancement request for this year, yes. Okay, so so over and above the programs you have existing for seniors, you are looking to expand that further this year to Toronto Community Housing. That is correct. And that's included in the budget that you proposed to us. Sorry, that, that isn't that is included. It's Larry Hughes, I'm director of finance with the library. It is included in the board's budget request, but it is not included in the city staff recommended budget. Okay. Um, what is being done in terms of fines this year? So in, uh, in 2021, uh, council approved funding for the elimination of children's fines. <clears throat> in 2022, the library board asked for funding 1.1 million dollars. Uh, to uh, eliminate adult and teen fines. So that initiative is being recommended uh, by city staff. However, the funding is uh, short by $500,000. Uh, 
So, uh, you know, we're, the library is happy that the elimination of all fines will take place this year, but there is a funding shortfall. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nunziata. Just a question on uh, uh, the question that Councillor McKelvey asked, and you indicated, uh, Pam, that you haven't cut that from the budget as far as the senior. Uh, but we're getting emails, I'm getting emails from seniors uh, being told that it is cut. So is there a miscommunication there somewhere? I don't know if Larry wants to, to, to speak to that. Sure. I, I don't know because I've been yeah. getting I've been getting emails from seniors saying the library is cutting and I've just heard that you're not. So I, I don't know. So the, the request for funding is in the library's budget and it's being characterized as being cut from the library's budget because it's not being recommended by this by city staff. So it is cut then? From the library's budget request as you, because we did request it as an enhancement. No, no, I'm not talking about that one. The, uh, not the one for the Toronto housing. Yeah, the, the ones that you have in the libraries. Sorry, councillor, which one is that? The, the, the question that councillor McKelvey asked, isn't it the uh, internet and the access that the seniors have, that they have that now in the libraries? I forget what program it is. Councillor McKelvey, the, you asked that question. <laughs> the digital literacy. Yeah. Like what we have is not being cut. I think that's the question we're asking. Yeah. But that's I'm correct. told it's I'm just not being expanded. That's correct. Okay, so but we're told that it's being cut. Am I wrong or because I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm getting emails. Sorry, so. Mr. Chair, on a point of order is Councillor Ainsley. Yeah. If I could I'm just jump in. Yeah, could you please? Yeah, okay. so Francis, I think I think you're getting uh, emails from the library union. I'm getting them as well. the The library union has been sending uh, email blasts out to their database, explaining that uh, the digital literacy program for seniors is being not funded or eliminated for. Well, then, then it must be the seniors because the emails I'm getting from are actually seniors. Um, so yeah, we have a digital literacy program for seniors and yeah. we've asked for an enhancement this year. So we asked for three things. We asked for the elimination of fines, the digital uh, literacy program for seniors and community librarians. And the, uni the union is focusing in on the seniors program, digital literacy program. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Sorry to because interrupt, I, Mr. Chair. No, that's okay. Thank you for that because all I know is I've been getting tons of emails from seniors and I was just wondering where that was coming from. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, any other questions on library? Just very quickly because I think there's some. Confusion. Oh, Councillor, I'm in your back. Okay. Just, just very, very quickly. The, the requested funds for the seniors' digital literacy that was requested by the library board is not included in the proposed budget. That's yeah. correct. So technically the emails you're getting, while some of them may say cut, which is a bit of a bit of a distraction, it was cut from the proposed budget. It was not uh, from the proposed uh, library board budget, uh, not cut from a previous city of Toronto budget. So it's, it's it's right that it's not in the budget right now. Okay, thank you. Sorry, clarity. So I, I I guess that the union is sending out misinformation then. No, 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 no. That wasn't my point. Yeah. My point was that their emails are accurate, but it's just it's it was cut from a proposed budget, and it's not in our proposed budget. Come on, get yeah. with it. No, I am with speaker. it. I am with it. That's we not have what clarity I, that's now, not right? The way we I interpret clarity. it. Anyway, okay, thanks everyone. Um, quickly, I'll say I'm going to go again going through agencies. Um, any questions on the Arena Boards of Management, Association of Community Centers, Exhibition Place, Heritage Toronto, TO Live, the Toronto Atmospheric Fund, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, and Toronto Zoo? 
didn't think there were a lot of questions. There were a few questions on TRCA last time, but they probably all were answered. Oh, the Young and Dundas Square. Sorry, that was the other one I forgot about. Okay. Um, last section or a couple of sections, uh, corporate services. Now, corporate services is including 311, Toronto, uh, corporate real estate management, environment and energy, fleet services, chief information security officer and technology services. So are there any questions on corporate services at all? I know we had quite a few questions uh, last week on that. Okay. Last section um, is, I'll just go through them, um, is create TO, the office, of the office of the CFO and Treasurer, Office of the Controller, City Manager's Office, Legal Services, City Clerk's Office, City Council, or Office of the Mayor. Any questions on any of those areas? Okay. I think we're at the point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Uh, Clerk, that we just, I know uh, Councillor McKelvey, that we've been looking at doing any more brief note requests. I understand Councillor McKelvey has one to speak to, and then we're done for the day. Do we have to, are we recessing or are we, what are we going to? Uh... Sure. Uh, we would need to uh, defer the item to the February 7th meeting as well. Defer the item. Okay, great. Okay, can, can I know Councillor McKelvey, you want to speak? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And with apologies, I probably should have put this one in last week, and I did. Um, I, I did miss sending this one in. Uh, just requesting the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, in collaboration with General Manager Parks, Forest, and Recreation, provide a briefing note on the proposed 2022 capital investments, including intergovernmental support and additional intergovernmental funding for the next five years and pending applications. And this is for the Metaway specifically. We did get this information for the ravines, but um, also just want to get it for the Metaway. Okay, sounds good. Um, vote on that. All, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Any other speakers? Or anything we, we want to speak to at all, uh, other than Councillor Carroll? Well, Mr. Chair, I, I I'm not going to move a, an, an additional briefing note, and I'm not going to uh, uh, not going to move a motion here, but. It, I, I I think it's fair because you're you're trying to to uh, chair a budget in a difficult time um, to to flag for you that for me the, the I have two really big outstanding issues that I I think we've uh, um, we have to look at and uh, funnily enough they they really mirror the uh, uh, some of the comments we've been getting from the public and some I will say we spent a lot of time today talking about the impact on. Uh, not ourselves, but the, the organizations in the community that we grant. And I think the, the reason you didn't hear from them this year was the speed with which we went through the budget in lockdown circumstances. And so some of them will, will not find out how, uh, how constrained that uh, envelope is getting until it's too late. They'll be doing their rounds late in February and uh, getting ready for uh, appeals they're not used to making because they, they, they usually succeed and some will not succeed if we keep shrinking that envelope. So I'm gonna follow up with staff and see if there's something we can do there. I think it's important to look at anyway, because um, we, we, we had a lucky dodge earlier this week in that the Bank of Canada didn't raise their rates, but they were very clear they're going to, and soon. And that coupled with the, the, the supply chain uh, uh, global matters means that uh, uh, some things are going to get very, very expensive and difficult to do. And so um, if 1% is what we're calling COLA, we maybe are going to need a new name. We're going to have to call it something other than cost of living adjustment because it certainly bears no relation <laughs> to what will be happening to the cost of living in this time frame. So I'm going to, to endeavor to, to speak to staff about that between now. It may take until we're transmitting to executive. And the other piece is uh, the piece that I was asking about in the police. The single most um, uh, often heard phrase during the uh, during the the budget deputations was, "Why is this police budget going up?" Um, well, I well I don't respond to the to the request <laughs> to uh, reduce a police budget by fifty percent. There there there's no way to do that. I do start to look at. Uh, you know, they've had to find efficiency to fund their uh, their uh, um, cost of living increase and not quite got there. And so 
most of what is their collective bargaining units uh, um, uh, wage increase, which actually is much closer to what will be a cost of living impact, most of it is still sitting there as an increase on the budget. They weren't able to absorb it. I know they're running very lean, um, which is why as much as we like uh, power case management, I really think we have to look at, at uh, uh, a software program that if they're spending a significant amount of, of uh, uh, resources to run it at the central provincial policing agency, I don't understand why it will, will, might take 40 civilians and 40 uniformed officers to run the, the, uh, the board uh, uh, service as it feeds that, that OPP central uh, data bank. I, I really don't understand that. That's how we used to do things before we had computers. With the computer, you're supposed to need fewer humans. So you put them out on the street to fight crime. So I will be uh, looking into that because uh, I think there is an opportunity to actualize what will probably be the real spending in 22, 2022 on this. Because uh, we heard very promising things from Chief Raymer when he came to our, our review last week, that he really felt that he needed to get in there and look at it as they were implementing it and come up with a, a real right size to how, how much human resource it will actually take to run a software management program. So those are two biggies. And while we may not have the solution to those problems by February 7th final wrap up, I certainly think there are things that we do have to solve before we adopt this budget for 2022. And, and those are things that, that through you and through staff, I'll be pursuing between now and, and then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Anyone else to speak before we defer? Okay. Uh, I'll move uh, to defer the item till next uh, budget meeting next week. All in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Uh, thank you again. Thank you to all the staff. I know we'll have a quick round uh, probably next week with everyone. Um, thanks, clerks, for all the work they did. And budget members, we'll see you next week. Thank you.